Um, so Janice, looks like we have a quorum for sure. Um, is Steve on? Yes, He's I'm on. Okay, your iPhone. Okay, good to know. All right, I, I think then we'll go ahead and start the meeting. Good, af good afternoon and welcome to all of you to another meeting of the Governor's Tax Council. Uh, because of the devastation caused by COVID on our state, the announcement will be made publicly very shortly that the governor has decided to extend the work of the tax council. We are hoping that all of you will be willing to continue working with us. Um, even though so many perceptions about the challenges faced by the public sector have changed since the council was first established back in 2019, the underlying mission of the council must still remain. And that is to evaluate the adequacy and equity of the state and local tax systems and to move us closer to the three-legged stool concept in Kansas. Our notion of adequacy may have changed quite a bit given the impact that the pandemic has had, not just on tax receipts, but also on demands for additional public service aid for individuals and for businesses. Moreover, even as we have all been focused on COVID caseloads, um, and business closures and other immediate metrics, there's a great many medium and long range social concerns that have yet to be realized and that are going to continue to provide additional stress that has yet to be realized and are going to, that, that we're going to have to deal with. In fact, research has shown that there was a significant mental health fallout from the 1919 Spanish flu um, that lasted for more than a decade. As we evaluate measures of equity guided by concepts like progressivity, progressivity and regressivity, we need to be realistic about that ongoing demand that are going to be placed on the public sector, even as our nation hopefully begin to emerge uh, from the worst crisis that we, as we move into 2021. Of course, we have seen in the past here in Kansas that cutting funding for our critical infrastructure and K-12 school system has proved to be penny wise and pound foolish with disastrous long-term consequences. So if there is to be any tax relief on the table uh, in this upcoming session, it needs to be very modest and carefully targeted to the people who need it the most. Um, Finally, I, I know that we have spent much of our time over the last year focused on the state and its tax issues, but our charge contemplates a broader charge of the entire state and local tax system. And local units of government, of course, rely on the property tax primarily. And I know that there were great many proposals floating around last session dealing with property tax issues. And one of the tax council's charges moving forward should be to monitor and potentially provide input into some of those discussions. We have a great deal of administrative uh, and legal expertise to avail available to us from PVD as well as local officials. And we hope that they can help us as we navigate these tax nuances. Uh, and I have to begin with, again, I apologize for all the information that had to be printed before this meeting. Um, hopefully we can deal with that in some other manner before the next meeting. But thank you all again, and Senator Morris. Turn it over thank, to you. Uh, thank you, Senator Lee, and I apologize for being on video or audio only. Hope you'll bear with me. I agree with what Senator Lee has just said. And to add to that, with this pandemic year, can you hear me all right, everyone? Yes, yes. To add that, uh, to that, we received a bit of good news with the consensus revenue estimate that was better than most of us thought, but we're still in the red ink going forward into the next budget year. So we, we need to, to really be cognizant of that. I anticipate that we will look at our recommendations from last year and we will probably want to recommend virtually the same set this year since the legislature was interrupted in midstream this past session and unable to act on, on those 
those uh, recommendations. Uh, we don't know whether they would have acted or not, but they, they had to adjourn before a lot of those had time to be looked at. Uh, we are going forward with a new legislature. We have a new federal administration. Uh, we don't know what will happen with, with the feds. So that's another unknown going forward. I would anticipate once the legislative session starts that we would have one or two regular meetings throughout the legislative session to sort of see where we are and where the legislature is with their tax committees. So with that, uh, thank you everyone for taking time to participate this afternoon. And thank you for your good work over the last couple of years. I know we thought we would be finished by now, but as if the pandemic uh, wasn't here, but we, we know this is a difficult year and we need to go forward. So thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, Senator Morris. We will turn now to uh, Division of the Budget, Larry Campbell. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, welcome this afternoon. Uh, this, the information uh, was sent to you in attachments, and that's what I'll be addressing today. And I'll take my time and identify where I am so that you can, it'll be easy to stay with me. One of your attachments was labeled, I think maybe 04 Octo October Revenue Fund. That'll be the first attachment I will be addressing. October Revenue Fund. Do I see some nods that you've got it? Oh, okay. Okay, uh, that attachment, there are two pages. The first page is the year to date for us, the fiscal year to date, 21 for the state, which is July through October. And then the second page was strictly the month of October. So I will be only talking about the first page, which is uh, FY21 year to date, uh, or FY year to date. And um, on the far left, and it, to acclimate you, you, many of you are familiar with this, and really the, the heavy lifting will be when you wanna look at this on your own. I'll just touch briefly on some of the components, but it's provided for your use for later. On the far left column is a box which says revenue source. Uh, you can see the various revenue sources on the left. Then the middle column compares where we were, the, the far left column in the middle box, which is, I'll just use an example, motor carrier, you see 3 million, 450,000. That number was estimated in April during our April CRE, then adjusted for legislation, which wasn't much, but there wasn't much adjustments. But you'll see where we estimated revenues in April. Then you'll the next column with, uh, again, using just motor carrier as an example, the next column shows the actual received to date. And that is 3 million uh, 349. Then you'll see the change, the dollar change, and the percentage change. So staying in that middle box, in April, you'll see down at the bottom, uh, well, just go to total taxes. Total taxes, uh, which is a little bit up from the bottom, we had projected uh, $2,678,000,000. But then in uh, what we actually have received for through October, is 2 billion 849 million. So uh, yes, uh, to repeat uh, Mr. Norris uh, uh, comments, we did have, we've had four good months of strong earnings. And in summary, our tax revenues uh, are 171 million over what we had estimated just in April. Then to continue down, then the next box is, uh, there's more to the revenue uh, picture than just taxes. And the other things are interest. We exceeded interest significantly. Um, uh, you'll see uh, net transfers were down and then agency earnings were up as, uh, as well. But to go back up at the top, to hit the big ones, individual income taxes, uh, we were 47 million over for the first four months than we had projected in April. Corporate tax, 37 million. Uh, the two big, next big ones are retail sales. Uh, we're 32 million over what we had projected in April. And then the compensating use tax, 46 million. 
then to uh, then to just familiarize you with this, the next box, the far right box, compares uh, actual for 21, the first four months in 21, to actual first four months in 20. So having done that, you will see, uh, for example, um, you will see, for example, in 20, the first four months of 20, the individual income tax was a, a roughly a billion and 90 million. So we are 442 million above that for first four months of 20. And that's how this chart flows. Um, I, since you've seen this before and this is an update, I don't want to prolong it, but I will certainly, uh, if it's your desire, uh, Chair, I will maybe wait on this form and, and see if there's questions on this form before we go to the next. Yes, let's yes. see, if, see if there's any questions. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, since I don't see any and I don't see any on chat either, then the next uh, attachment to pull up, please. It's, uh, I think the attachment is labeled short memo 11620. And I'll give you a minute to pull that up. And if um, Larry or Anthony, if you give me a nod when you got it. So I, okay, you got it. All right. Um, so it, it works to start with our, our October uh, receipts. So we did that first. So then after receiving, uh, getting the October uh, receipts and revenues. Then on November 6, twice a year, once in April and once in November, we did the uh, cons consensus revenue estimating process again. And this, uh, this page explains what our thoughts are going forward. And in summary, you will see that uh, we redid the estimates and showed an increase in 21 of 477 million. So for the first four months of 21, we were 171 million over. We're thinking that in all of 21, we will have exceeded 477 million over what our previous estimates were. Um, but that, uh, that's, that's a little uh, complex because that's because of some blips and because of some moving revenues around uh, because of tax policy then if you'll look in 22, the third paragraph on that page, uh, we're showing a 2.1% decrease in revenues in 22 over 21. 21 is showing strong, but there's some uh, reasons for that, we think, the, the, the group thought, uh, meaning with the stimulus and some other things. But in 22, we're projecting a little bit of a decrease uh, from 21. Then the second page, uh, is just the table that shows uh, those, uh, that gives you the numbers for that. Uh, with the, and as you can see, table one just simply compares the revised estimates for FY21 and FY22 with the actual receipts from FY20. And then table two, your third sheet, uh, just shows the changes within FY21. Um, my last statement, and then I'll answer questions, is with the stronger than expected revenue receipts for FY21, coupled with the allotments previously made by the governor, the FY22 budget picture has indeed improved. However, there may need to be some cuts still in FY22 and for sure going forward. Uh, the picture is evolving, uh, but it's, it's still, um, we still need we still need to be very diligent and uh, FY 23 and 24 are gonna be tough. Um, and I'll just remind you the allotments made by the governor that got us to this point were about 360 million. And then uh, the rest of the allotment plan was for the legislature to pass, which may still be needed or not. That's up to the governor. Uh, to let you know where we are in the process, we just received all agency budgets uh, we are in the appeal phase now, uh, which are the 23rd and 24th, and then the governor begins um, what's called Gov Week. She, she uh, comes in and uh, for a couple weeks uh, puts together her budget, and that begins on December 1st. And with that, uh, Madam Chair, I will see if there's questions. Any questions? I 
have a question. Go ahead. So I mean, do we have a sense of how much of this uh, sort of better than expected funding is coming from you know, the CARES Act money that came into the state through enhanced unemployment benefits, the stimulus payments and things of that nature? What, what happens in those discussions is this. Uh, it, we can try to project why and what happened? Did people just take their stimulus money and, and, and buy things? Uh, there is a lot of guesswork that goes into that. I would, uh, that I don't have a good answer. I mean, we, we can hypothesize why, but uh, my guess is as good, or is probably not better than uh, Mark with the revenue, or uh, I've also got on board uh, uh, Sean Toombs, who is the guru guru in our shop for this. Um, if you don't mind, uh, Sean, do you have a better answer for that? Uh, yeah, th yeah. This is Sean Toom from the Division of Budget. We we didn't have a, a specific amount, a dollar amount. Obviously, we looked at withholdings that have been performing really strong, um, even when the the unemployment, you know, the a lot of files, the claims were filed. Uh, we do think, though, that, you know, with the unemployment stuff, that that's not it. They elect to not withhold taxes. There might be an April surprise for some of those people that uh, had un unemployment benefits that they'll have tax bills that will have come due in April. That was so we, we, we did see maybe a little bit of a slowdown in the start, you know, next year a little bit. Um, but really we did a look at a lot of the, the deadline extension was a thing that we really had to keep in mind. We, when we met in April, there was uh, almost $650 million that we said was gonna move from fiscal 20 to fiscal 21. Um, and I think some of the information we heard from the Department of Revenue that we, we ended up fiscal 20 a little bit better. And because I think some of that did not uh, Push through to 21 that we thought it was instead of 650, it might have been 450 or 400. So, um, it's gonna it's gonna take years for us to probably delve down into the detail um, with uh, uh, what what actually worked and what didn't work. But um, this was our our best uh, estimate at this point. Snap in time. Thank you for that. I mean, there may be a risk going forward uh, if revenues had been supported by all of the federal money that came from the CARES Act. Um, if there's no follow-up CARES Act, then there might be, you know, a more bleak revenue picture in, in the future. Uh, you know, maybe um, Richard could, from the Urban Institute, could comment on that uh, a bit later when he talks, or now if he wants to. Well, and Donna, I will I will refer back to page two of the short memo. Uh, I think we took we, I think the committee tried to take that into account, and that's why you'll see a twenty two estimate is two point nine percent less than twenty one. And this is Sean Tim again here, just to remind too that it's you know there's been all these rumors probably for six months that the, the next wave of a stimulus package, the, the CRE process is, is existing law and, and those current interpretations. And so we did not factor in a future stimulus package in our CRE estimates. Hopefully by April, when we, we meet again, th then if there's a stimulus, then we will factor that into our estimates going forward. And if there are no other questions, I'd be remiss in not saying uh, in, in no small way, the revenue, the strong revenues and sales tax and use tax uh, has, I, in my opinion, a lot to do with the Department of Revenue uh, diligently sending out notices and calling people to the task of paying their tax, you know, out of state folks paying taxes. So that. I, it's it's hard to know how much that uh, has played in, but I hope uh, I think Mark will have some information here in just a minute. 
Any other questions for Larry? Oh. Am I still muted? No, we heard you. Okay, then any other questions for Larry? If thank you. Not, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Larry, very much for that report. Um, with that, we'll move on to the discussion regarding the council recommendations from previous years and extension of the council from Mark Burkhart. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. You should have a memo uh, that's been uh, provided which summarizes the recommendations that the council made last year. And uh, I guess just a bit of commentary. Um, we at the department believe that the recommendations that the council made were very sound policy choices. And with the pandemic, those choices are even looking more important than last year. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, but did just want to review very briefly the seven proposals or recommendations from the council last year that was included in the council's interim report uh, roughly a year ago. So let's talk uh, first about digital goods. This particular proposal, again, would just add digital goods to state sales tax base. And as we've discussed previously, when our sales tax law was enacted 83 years ago, no one in that time frame had any idea we would be operating uh, in the type of economy that we have today. So 83 years ago, roughly everything was uh, uh, tangible personal property and, and certain services. Now we have digital goods. And a lot of the thinking of the council, as you will recall, was dealing with this disparate treatment of Main Street merchants. And this was another way to equalize and, and uh, level the playing field for uh, the Main Street merchant who sells their products. It's tangible personal property when you go down town and buy a book, uh, you're going to pay sales tax. But if that same book is delivered electronically to a purchaser, no tax is collected. So uh, our sales tax has not really kept up with the times. And this is one way to bring our sales tax system a little bit more in the uh, into conformity with what our economy is really doing. So as you will, uh, as you will see um, the fiscal note uh, that was prepared and, and quite honestly, our fiscal notes uh, were prepared in large part prior to the pandemic. And we are reassessing those notes uh, because they may change uh, in a positive direction uh, because of the pandemic again, because of changes in the purchasing habits of folks who are confined, confined to their homes during the pandemic period and making purchases online, including purchases of digital goods. Kansas is, uh, again, a, a bit behind in updating its statutory provisions. There are I think at this point in time, uh, a couple more states have jumped on board, and I think we're over 30 states now tax, tax digital goods in one form or another. So uh, that was one of the recommendations of the council last year. And again, the, the policy decisions for doing it a year ago make more sense now in light of the pandemic and the fact that there are unintended exemptions or exclusions being granted to digital goods that 
simply were never legislated or intended. So whether a book is purchased in hard form or in digital form, tax treatment should be the same. And the, obviously the impact is going to be positive for the state treasury. So let's move on then to uh, the second item that was uh, recommended. Uh, it's the marketplace facilitator uh, legislation. And just a very quick review. And, and again, we spent some time on this this last year, sort of going through the history of the state's ability to require out-of-state companies to collect and remit use tax on sales of goods made into the state of Kansas. And again, as you will recall, uh, our Sales Tax Act and our Compensating Use Tax Act were both enacted in 1937. Eight years later in 1945, the legislature enacted a statute that basically required out-of-state companies to collect and remit on sales of goods into the state of Kansas. Along comes the United States Supreme Court decision in National Bellis Hess in 1967, and that sort of put a halt to any efforts by the department to require out-of-state companies to collect and remit. And that case essentially focused on the burden on out-of-state companies at the time in order to uh, have them be able to collect and remit a, a state's compensating use tax when there may be multiple taxing jurisdictions, municipalities within a state that might have their own uh, tax rates. Keep in mind, back in 1967, there wasn't much of a uh, uh, sophisticated uh, level of technology uh, for accounting for these various taxes within the states. And so obviously there, there was a burden, uh, a pretty meaningful burden on out-of-state companies to collect and remit. But over time, with the development of technology, that burden was greatly lessened. And so the states for a number of years worked together to pick a test case to challenge National Bellis Hess and that effort resulted in a number of states amending their state laws and Kansas was one of those. And we did that in, in uh, 1990, basically to posture Kansas so that if the United States Supreme Court came down and set aside the National Bellis Hess case that we could immediately start collect, you know, requiring companies to collect and remit. So that effort was, uh, again, it wasn't an accident that Quill was being litigated in the state of North Dakota. This, this was all by design 30 years ago. And uh, unfortunately, when Quill did come down in 1992, it did not reverse National Bellis Hess. So a number of years pass again, um, and then another effort to get the states prepared for a reversal of Quill and National Bellis Hess. Um, you know, a, another effort was, was underway. Uh, and in Kansas again in, in 2000, uh, and I believe it was in actually 2000, uh, we uh, again amended our statutory provisions to again posture Kansas such that we would be able to uh, require out-of-state companies to collect and remit uh, if there was, wasn't any constitutional impediment any longer. In other words, waiting for a favorable U.S. Supreme Court decision. 2018, along comes Wayfair. Supreme Court comes down and says that uh, there is no longer a physical presence requirement in order for companies to be required to collect and remit a compensating use tax and, for sales into a given state. So at that point in time, we have a statute that's on our books. It's been on the books for many, many, many years. And now there's no 
impediment to enforcing that statute. So what the department did on August 1, 2019, we did send a notice out to um, out-of-state retailers. We published it on our website, but putting them on notice that here's what our law says, here's what the Supreme Court said, you know, you should start collecting and remitting, get registered with the state of Kansas on October 1 in uh, uh, 2019. And since that time, and, and we've just run the numbers on this, since that time, we've had 5,362 companies out of state, remote sellers get registered with the state of Kansas. So from October 1, 2019, to the current date. During that same time period, as those increased registrations occurred, we also saw an increase in receipt. And again, this, this tax is nothing new. It's been on the books for 83 years. The problem was it could never be collected, collected effectively. Now we have that opportunity to collect the tax that's been due. So since October 1 of 2019, our receipts have been increasing. And for that period of time from October 1, 2019 through September of 2020, compensating use tax receipts for $75 million greater than the prior 12 months. Some of that is attributable to increased registrations because of the notice that went out and just because of the Wayfair decision itself. You know, a lot of companies registered even before the notice went out. So that's one reason we think obviously increased registrations had a dramatic impact, but also just the changing purchasing patterns of consumers a lot are switching to online purchases instead of going downtown and making purchases uh, at a local store. So the, the belief is that we are going to have more and more online purchases as consumers get accustomed to making online purchases. So we're gonna perhaps see a decline in sales tax revenues and maybe an increase in use tax revenues. So the problem is our state law requires out of state sellers who are selling into the state, making direct sales to collect and remit. Marketplace facilitators who basically operate platforms that allow third-party sellers out of state to use their platform to make sales in the state, those marketplace facilitators are not required to collect and remit under existing law. That's what the proposal that was recommended by the council last year does. It requires, out of, uh, it requires marketplace facilitators to collect and remit. This is becoming, again, uh, even more important now, this particular uh, concept of requiring marketplace facilitators to uh, collect and remit, because again, we think that, and we're going to have to watch this very closely, we think that we will see a greater shift from individuals making purchases subject to sales tax, which are basically in-state purchases, seeing the shift to going online and making purchases from out of state. So you will see sales tax receipts, which we collect those. If you're selling tangible personal property or services, taxable services in Kansas, those taxes are being collected. Those folks are registered with the department. But if purchasers go online and they're making purchases from out of state companies, those companies may not be registered with Kansas. And if it's a marketplace facilitator, those, those taxes are not going to be collected. 
So we are going from a, a purchases where the, the tax is collected to purchases where the tax perhaps might not be collected. And you're, you're saying, well, how meaningful are the sales from marketplace facilitators? Uh, we've done some checking on this and you know, some of the, the largest uh, e-commerce retailers in the world, uh, the percentage of sales that they make on their platform, and, and I'll just give you the example, is, is, is Amazon, over 50% of their sales are not their product. It's from third-party sellers who are using the Amazon platform to make their sales into the state. Taxes are not collected on those sales. That's why this particular provision is so important. You'll see a, a, a fiscal note there uh, for FY 2021 and 22. And we think those, again, uh, are pretty conservative. They were done really before the, the pandemic and haven't changed much, but we are looking at that very closely. And here's why. Um, State of Kansas Department of Revenue, we, we participate with several national organizations uh, of state tax administrators. And, you know, discussion occurs what other states are doing and, and uh, the revenue impact in those states. One of the East Coast states that we've communicated with uh, had a fiscal note for a marketplace facilitator provision, uh, which they thought was roughly 35 million a year. As it turned out, the receipts resulting from that change was actually 145 million. So uh, again, we're looking at the Kansas fiscal note very closely to see if those numbers need to be revised upward. So anyway, that's the second proposal. Again, this, this is a very, very important piece of legislation. Um, Kansas is just one of three states uh, that doesn't have a marketplace facilitator provision. I believe uh, Missouri and Florida do not have such a provision. So, you know, Larry was going through the receipts for October and, and this fiscal year, and you can see the growth in compensating use tax because of the changing purchasing habits of Kansas consumers. In this year alone, and, and you know, just since January, January, the state of Kansas, this was pre-pandemic, collected the largest monthly amount of compensating use tax in state history. It was 52 million. We followed up in July with 50 million, and we followed up in October of 50 million again. So three months in this calendar year, 50 million or more, uh, really uh, emphasizing the fact that we're just seeing more and more purchases uh, being made online and um, tax beginning to be collected on those uh, particular sales into the state of Kansas. So that's enough for that particular proposal. Uh, again, uh, I guess just to go back for a second, there, there were a number of bills introduced last year and the council's bill was one of those. And uh, again, we are hopeful that uh, there will be more serious consideration during this coming legislative session. You know, we're all still wondering how this, the session is going to develop in light of what's going on in the country with the pandemic and uh, hopefully uh, some very important pieces of legislation will be able to make their way through the process this year. So the next item that the council dealt with was uh, a recommendation that a refundable income tax credit uh, be enacted and this would be basically for uh, food sales and uh, 
again, we kind of went through the history of, of uh, these types of programs in Kansas. The law that we have on the books now basically grants a $125 credit based upon um, the number of exemptions for a particular uh, taxpayer. There's no refund and that there's no carry forward and it's just not used very often. This current system was put in place, you know, uh, I think 2012. Prior to that, we had a system like what the council recommended uh, that there would in fact be a, a, a refund uh, available to taxpayers. When uh, we were having hearings last year, uh, we had a number of conferees, conferees come in and talk about the need for some targeted relief for families in Kansas, instead of just doing a, a one penny decrease in the sales tax on food. And, and keep in mind that a, a penny on sales tax is the equivalent of about $60 million in state revenue. So instead of just lowering the sales tax by a penny on food, which is worth $60 million, which doesn't give much relief. If, if, you, if you look at a, a family who spends $200 a week, you extrapolate that, you, you basically get tax relief of about $2.15 a week if you lower the, the sales tax on food by a penny. But if you target the relief to those who really need it, you can get um, a, a much more uh, equitable result. And the, the estimates that we were doing was that we could see perhaps as many as 400,000 uh, families benefiting from a targeted relief package, um, which would, uh, if, for example, a married couple uh, could, could uh, receive a benefit of $240 uh, a year um, instead of the credit that they may or may not qualify for and it wasn't refundable and it couldn't be carried forward. So uh, in any event, that was the recommendation of the council. And uh, again, in light of the circumstances of the, uh, the legislative session, uh, it, it, did not, uh, it did not make it through the process. The uh, fourth item uh, that the council recommended was to um, basically make an, an exception in the property tax lid uh, for local units for local transportation projects. Uh, again, uh, that particular proposal did not let go anywhere. You know, we did have the comprehensive highway plan that passed this past session, but I don't recall there being any provision in that particular plan that would address this particular issue. Uh, again, this isn't something that has a particular fiscal note for the state of Kansas, but it, uh, it uh, does provide the opportunity for local units to get more involved and contribute to transportation projects. The uh, next item, um, was a recommendation that the legislature fund the uh, local outdoor and property tax reduction fund, the LABTRF, which hasn't been done since I believe 2002 um, by funding that. And, and right now statutorily, it would be somewhere in the neighborhood, I think of uh, 54 million, 27 million twice a year. Again, that that didn't really require legislation, but uh, that did not occur uh, as well. Um, and again, it was just deemed to be a mechanism to provide some local property tax relief. The fifth or the next recommendation, uh, sixth recommendation, just reaffirmation of a three-legged stool for funding state government, you know, property sales and income taxes 
in theory, having a roughly uh, equivalent uh, amount for each. Uh, that has been sort of a staple of the Kansas tax system for a number of years now. And again, because of the pandemic, perhaps has contributed to where we are financially in the state, notwithstanding the pandemic. States that rely so heavily on a single tax, uh, I think Florida as an example, heavy sales tax. I can't imagine what Florida, if they rely on a sales tax and they don't have folks coming into the state vacationing there, spending dollars, what's that's what that is going to do to their state budget. So uh, again, the, the council recommended or that the three-legged stool approach be reaffirmed. And uh, if the council were so inclined to make that recommendation again, perhaps some indication that this particular approach to state finance is even more important now uh, just because of what we are experiencing with the pandemic. And then uh, the final item was the uh, note of caution to the governor and the legislature to be careful about making any drastic changes to the, the funding structure within the state simply because the state was still digging out of a, a, a very deep hole, I guess, or, or trying to get itself out of a, a funding a hole uh, resulting from uh, some tax policies that had been in place for prior years. Um, and even the suggestion of having a, a rainy day fund. Again, this might be an area uh, that in light of the pandemic, more emphasis also needs to be made on the, on the, the fact that um, we need to be careful going forward. This might also be an area if the council was so inclined to make some reference to the need for additional federal stimulus. Dr. Ginther mentioned that previously. We don't know, we can't quantify at this point in time what the prior stimulus has meant to the state of Kansas, but it has obviously helped the crops. Um, and additional stimulus at this point in time uh, would be appropriate and, and uh, perhaps should be recommended uh, as well by the, the council. So that's a very quick review of the uh, proposals that the council came up with last year. Uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Mark? Yeah. Mark, were any of these um, ideas even discussed in the legislature this last session? I know it got cut short, but were any of them actually discussed? Yes, uh, several of them had hearings, um, but um, you know, once we got to the month of March, everything just stopped. Um, there, there was an effort actually during the, the uh, special session to uh, work a compromise on a marketplace facilitator bill. But again, just because of the time constraints uh, for that special session, uh, that was not able to be accomplished. But there, yeah, there was attention uh, paid to some of these proposals and there were hearings, but again, uh, the circumstances were not such that they were able to make it through. Any quest other questions or comments at this point? Well, before we end our meeting today, uh, we will be considering these and try to decide if we also want to recommend that as uh, our recommendations for this year. With that, we will go on to uh, the next item, which is the state response to COVID from the Urban Institute. Are you ready, Urban I Institute? <laughs> yes, and, and thank you so much uh, to everyone here for inviting us back. We really enjoy getting to interact uh, and learn. Hopefully, we learned definitely as much from you as hopefully you're learning from us. And also special thanks to Donna and Corey, who are always so great with um, setting this up. Uh, my name is Richard Oksher. 
I'm from the Tax Policy Center and the Urban Institute. And you know, you're getting a lot of incredible uh, Kansas focused data and insight. And what I think I've been asked here to do is kind of broaden the lens a bit and, and still focus on Kansas, but show uh, kind of how you fit. And, and I think don't fit uh, in with what's happening in the rest of the country right now. So if you bear with me for just a minute, um, I would like to share my screen and upload some slides. That should, hopefully that's working for everyone. Excellent. So um, in this brief presentation, uh, um, I wanna tackle three subjects. Uh, first, I wanna talk a little bit about why the current econo economic downturn varies uh, significantly, significantly across states. Um, Donna Ginther is gonna have a really great in-depth presentation on all of these topics. But you know, when we get into my next point, which is how revenue has changed since March, um, it's kind of important to set the scene uh, for what the economy looks like and how the economy differs across the country in response to this pandemic. Uh, and then finally, I'll get into what you've all asked me to talk about. It's like, what are states actually doing? What are the policy changes um, being made? Uh, if anyone has any questions at any point, I'm more than happy to take interruptions, uh, make clarifications. I think if you also uh, send chats, I can respond to them, although I'm a little nervous that I might not be able to see them while presenting the slides. But let's jump in. Um, in setting up the revenue conversation and discussing the economy, I think you know, it's important to keep two things in your mind at the same time, which is that the recession is both unprecedented in its size and, and severity of this downturn, um, but that severity still you know, varies significantly across states. On the first part, what you're seeing uh, on this slide are aggregate number of unemployment insurance claims. Um, this isn't a perfect measure, but I think it shows something. What it shows is that, you know, throughout this entire downturn, or, or since COVID really kicked in in the middle of March, um, the slide says Kansas has had about 578,000 claims. That's clo that number is closer to 600,000 when you add in the claims that were, you know, uh, released this morning uh, in the in the update. Um, but what I think is good to look at is that, you know. We often compare the current downturn to the previous downturn, which is the Great Recession. But it's important to remember that that was also an outlier. That was also uh, a significant difference. If you look at you know how long we've gone, since mid-March has roughly been as long as um, two other recessions, the 2001 recession and the 1990 recession. Um, but the number of unemployment insurance claims, you know, you, in Kansas, you have close to you know 400 or 500 thousand more during this recession than you did during those two recessions. And you even have roughly twice as many unemployment insurance claims as you've had during the entire Great Recession, which was lasted twice as long, which lasted some 81 weeks. We're only 34, 35 weeks into this downturn. It's also been, you know, th this recession is different in that, you know, you've had so many ups and downs. And, and Donna, I've seen some of her slides and I think she's gonna do a good job of showing you different baselines. And I think baselines are important for understanding what's happening, um, what's good and what's not so good. Um, Kansas's unemployment rate was 3.1% in January and it skyrocketed along with the rest of the country to 11.9% in April. Now it's back down to 5.9% and we're gonna actually get a new number uh, for October tomorrow. And if you can look at this one way and say that, you know, Kansas' unemployment rate has been, you know, cut in half since its peak, that's good. You could also flip that and say, well, it's doubled what it was in January. Um, that's not so good. And so while things are definitely better than they were from over the summer, they're by no means good. And you can see this too if you look at Kansas and its neighbors. Um, Kansas and its neighbors typically have, you know, unemployment rates, you know, roughly in that, uh, I'm not even in that range of you know six to seven percent. Um, they're all below the U.S. average, which is I think eight percent on this slide, but is now closer to seven percent with the October update. Um, but they're all lower, but they're all still significantly higher than the rates were you know throughout 2019. And if I was to expand this graph and push it back to 2008, you would see that the unemployment rates in both Kansas and its neighboring states are roughly what they were, you know, at the beginning of the recovery 
of the Great Recession. You know, not, not the max, not the highest that it reached during the Great Recession, but still relatively high when there was still a lot of work left to be done in the recovery and, and you know, still a need for assistance as states came back from the lows. And of course, they're now coming back from you know, even a deeper hole during this recession in states across the country. If you look at private um, job losses, uh, you know, January through September, Kansas has lost about 5% of its private employment. Um, again, like with unemployment rates, that's both you know, relatively good compared to the national average, uh, which is closer to, I think, 8%. Um, and the same is still true, you know, and the same is true of its neighboring states. If you look at Colorado, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma, all with roughly 5% of private job losses, but that's still significant. That's still an incredible change that I don't think, you know, you could have possibly imagined um, back in January. And that's still the hole that we're all trying to dig out of um, as things get better. One important thing to note is that in all of these states, except for Oklahoma, the industry uh, that has seen the greatest percentage of job loss and the you know, greatest number of total job loss is leisure and hospitality. Oklahoma is a bit different because they are so reliant on the mining, excuse me, on the oil industry, which is included in mining and BLS data. That was its largest percentage drop. But, you know, one reason that, you know, the economic downturn is bad everywhere, but more severe in some states is that the leisure and hospitality industry or accommodation and services, whatever you want to call it, has just been absolutely hammered. And the more a state relies on that industry, the larger that industry is, the worse the economic pain has been. Uh, if you zoom out, this is a map of uh, GDP declines in the second quarter of 2020 compared with the second quarter of 2019. And you'll notice that the states that have seen the most significant drops, Hawaii, nearly 14%, uh, New York, 12%, Vermont, 12%, are states that have a very large accommodation and food service sector. And what's important to note about that is the correlation, at least at the moment, is not necessarily with uh, COVID cases. Vermont's a good example of this. Vermont has the lowest number of COVID cases per capita of any state in the country, but its economic you know, decline, and you know, that's both GDP and the number of job losses, it's high. It's lost like the third highest percentage of jobs since this all started. You know, that's not because the state has a lot of COVID cases, it doesn't, but it's because it's so reliant on those service industries that have been particularly hard hit. And I think as, you know, at least during the summer and fall, this was still true even as, you know, executive and government regulations were pared back because it's not only explicit government restrictions, it's changes in behavior, in consumer behavior, in where you shop, how you shop. Uh, where you go, the the restaurants you visit, the the you know whether you, people not going to sporting events or to movie theaters, and so the more your state has been, or the larger those industries are in your state, the worse it has been in terms of your economic decline. Another one worth noting though is also energy states. If you look at Oklahoma to your south has been particularly hard hit. That's not a direct result of people not being allowed to go to their jobs, you know, working at. Uh, working in oil or other energy industries, that's been because people are driving their cars less, people are flying less. And as a result, that has these ripple effects that can go back and cause job losses. And so it's an interesting mix. There are a lot of factors that are determining whether a state is severely hurt or just merely hurt. Because you know, while there is this severity, the unprecedented nature of this downturn is true in states across the country. Why are Utah and Arizona one of the lower in terms of how they've been hit? That's a great question. And I am going to defer it in a way in which I talk about that, you know, I just want to be a little humble and that it's, you would have to look into everything about that state. I think we know enough to say that if your state has a very large um, uh, service sector, it is going to be hurt. It has a very large oil sector or energy sector. It is going to be hurt. Now, what keeps, like Washington's is another state, you know, I guess my guess would be, and we'll talk about this a bit in a minute, you know, certain sectors have not been so much hurt. If you are working an office job and you've simply transitioned to working that at home, 
you know, you might still be earning the same amount of income and generating the same amount of economic growth. Um, and if there just aren't that many service sector employees who have lost their jobs, you might be able to tread water more than a state like Nevada or Hawaii, who is so uh, reliant on drawing people in and drawing people into certain places for economic activity. Okay, thank you. So, and that's a good way of setting this up, which is when we're gonna talk about state revenue changes. And there's also this significant variance, which is gonna go back to that point about why are some states better than others? And I'll get into what we know and what we don't know. Uh, and then I think, you know, also for this group looking forward, um, I'll touch on why there's a case for optimism, but a better argument um, for caution. And so this was touched on in one of the, you know, earlier presentations that I do think it's worth flagging that, um, so Kansas, uh, saw its total tax revenue from March through August fall 5.7. It's 5.7 percent lower than it was during the same period in 2019. Um, that's roughly average, but there's incredible variation. If you look at the same period again, March through uh, March through August or September uh, this year versus last year, it ranges from a 31 percent decline in Alaska to a 10.2 percent increase in Idaho. And again, it's, it's, you know, it's on the extremes you can explain this. Like again, with Alaska, Alaska is so dependent on uh, severance taxes related to, you know, natural resource extraction that they have again, unfortunately fallen into a really tough place. Um, why is tax revenue increased 10.2% in Idaho? That's tougher. Um, it doesn't have a huge service sector. Uh, it has a relatively diverse tax base, you know, the, we talked, you know, we, people have mentioned the three stools, the more balanced you are right now, the better you're probably doing in terms of you're not being, you know, left vulnerable to one particular tax falling down. But it's a lot easier right now to tell what's going wrong than what's possibly going right. Um, and if you look at your neighbors. Richard, can yes. I just add something? So partly you might think it's weird that we're talking about this March through August or September period. Partly we started looking at that rather than fiscal years and just quarters mm -hmm. to take it, to acknowledge the fact that because of the tax shifting that happened at the end of the last fiscal year, different states put some of that money that was shifted over the summer into the prior year worth this, this one. So partly we started looking at the March through August period or March through September to get away from the fact that there was significant shifting of when income came in mm -hmm. over the last six months. That's, that's it. Right. And it's again, us trying to do as much apples to apples as we can, given that there's been all sorts of variation. Um, and if you look at your neighboring states, again, you see a pretty you know, sizable range. Um, Colorado and Nebraska have been relatively flat. Um, whereas Missouri and Oklahoma have seen losses. Missouri is similar to Kansas, exactly the same as Kansas, 5.7%. Oklahoma, 6.6%. Again, it's easier for me to say Oklahoma's had a tough time because of its dependence on severance taxes. Um, it's a little harder to, you know, we've looked at this to figure out why Nebraska and Colorado uh, have made. But it's also worth pointing out that, you know, 0.3% growth is not much growth. And that there are a few states who are doing well, there's mostly, you know, treading water, doing poorly and doing worse. Um, and again, this is, it's difficult. We're doing the best we can to come up with this, but there's a big, uh, there's a lot of inputs here uh, based one, the prevalence of the virus, um, what a state's major economic sectors are and its revenue system. Like, you know, what, are, what taxes are you dependent on? What taxes are you not dependent on? And all of these are affecting how states are doing. Um, but lessons learned so far, uh, we, we do know a few things. One is that the income tax revenue declines were not as bad as originally predicted. Um, but unfortunately, this is, this is kind of a sad story in that the most negatively affected workers during this downturn have been low income workers. The workers who work at hotels, restaurants, who work in those service industry jobs, who have seen you know, such dramatic falls uh, in their employment levels. Um, but these workers, one, they, they often do not withhold tax from their paychecks. So that hasn't seen a change in the amount of tax coming in. And then also for you know, many low-income workers, states have provisions that you know, prevent them from paying income tax, whether those are standard deductions or earned income tax credits. Um, the fluctuations in these workers' incomes are not working and working doesn't actually have a big effect 
on a state's tax revenue, whereas people who work higher income jobs who have been able to shift from working in an office to working at home, they're still earning a paycheck, they're still having their tax withheld, at least so far. It's a worse story on, uh, from a tax revenue perspective on sales tax, where we really have seen, again, it's these you know, service industry jobs or service industries that have been most negatively affected. Um, and so states that rely on this, states like California, Florida, Hawaii, uh, New York, have really seen a, a downturn in their sales tax revenue. And I think this was brought up in the previous conversation. There's, there is definitely some substitution, some people who are not going uh, on trips or not going to the theater or not going to a sporting event, maybe we'll purchase more stuff at home. And, and hopefully because we have online sales taxes now, that's some of that's being made up. But if, if your state is, or your city, which is another huge component of this, is specifically dependent on those things and the taxes related to those you know, in-person service sector jobs, you're gonna see negative effects. Uh, for this group, one thing that's important to note that groceries have definitely not been on this list and that states, the tax groceries have been, you know, that's been a part of what has kept them, you know, from seeing some of the lows that other states have. Uh, and again, oil dependent and energy dependent states have seen particularly um, negative downturns, both in their economies and in their taxes, depending on how much they're reliant on severance tax revenues. States like New Mexico and Oklahoma have specifically seen uh, downturns as a result. Now, this is just in map form. Um, again, some stories are simple. Florida, Texas, these are states incredibly reliant on sales taxes. These are states with relatively large service sectors. Um, and therefore, they've seen a particularly large drop in tax revenue between March and September. Kansas is in that kind of lighter state of red where most of the country is. I would just mentioned the guess because it's, you know, has a relative, it doesn't rely overly much on the service sector. It has a relatively balanced mix. Um, Again, the bluer states are a little hard to figure out, but it's also important to keep in mind that like Colorado and Nebraska, they're not necessarily experiencing growth so much as they've just been able to keep out of the red um, up until this point. Um, but the only ways to look at that is just again, trying to maybe have a relatively balanced system or being lucky in that the service, the sectors you rely on have not been as negatively affected as others. Um, in the future, this was a presentation we just heard, so I won't go into this too much. Uh, that you know, there was a recent the, the division of budget put out a recent revenue report. Um, that was far more optimistic than previous reports. But I think I was listening to some of this. I, I didn't catch it all, but I think it was presented well. In that, you know, perspective is again really important here. I, I read an AP story that I think was way too rosy trying to report on this. But if you actually read the report, they were you know specific in saying that. You know, revenue will increase in fiscal year 2021 relative to fiscal year 2020. But of course, revenue was down in fiscal year 2020. And further, they're estimating a decrease in fiscal year 2022 relative to 2021. So if you take a step back, while things have certainly or hopefully improved uh, from what we were looking at in April, it is, you know, by no means a, a positive outlook. And this is something that's very true across states where, you know, from California, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, Colorado, reports or forecasts have become more optimistic. Uh, they are not as, as completely doom and gloom as they were in April. But again, that by no means, you know, they are also by no means projecting like, you know, anything in good, you know, happening, positive outcomes happening. And if you look beyond the current year where um, and I'll talk about this in a minute, where, you know, we've gotten so much, we've gotten a, a large degree of federal report in the current calendar year, you know, in, in terms of both direct fiscal assistance and unemployment expansion. Uh, if you look out towards fiscal 22, you again begin to see these revenue declines or stagnant revenues and future years, 23, 24, there's not much of a bright picture either. And then that goes back to the idea of like, you know, again, focusing on things that we know and, and things that we don't know. And so we do not know at this moment how the spread of the virus uh, and changes in the economy, what will happen during the winter months. Uh, but we do know that COVID counts are at record highs right now. And that states across the country are implementing or thinking about you know, tougher economic restrictions. Um, we don't know if Congress will provide further fiscal aid um, 
for states. And I know, I know Donna mentioned like whether we could expound on this and unfortunately we don't have any insights that you don't have right now because so much of this is political and, and we just, it's, it's impossible for us to map that out. Um, but we do know that the aid that was provided over the spring directly for state and local governments has been spent. And we do know that the other economic provisions that were so important to state and local budgets, like expanded unemployment insurance and support for small business is expiring or will go away at the end of the year. And unfortunately, we also know that we've kind of seen this movie before in that you know, Congress's failure to pass further assistance during the Great Recession really prolonged the economic downturn and particularly harmed the ability of state and local governments uh, to recover. They, there was the American you know, Recovery Act that was incredibly helpful, spurred the economy and gave state and local governments the support that they needed uh, to keep going. But when that ran out, there was not a second or third bill. And that's why you saw things, for example, if you look at state and local government employment uh, that peaked in 2008 and did not hit that level again until October, 2019. So it took over 11 years for state and local governments to get to the employment levels they had before the recession. It's a similar story uh, for many states in their general revenue and expenditure levels. Um, and now we're unfortunately possibly going back into that cycle where it's gonna take a long time to dig out of this. And that brings us to how states are responding, what, what fiscal changes are states making, uh, seeing the same things that we're seeing here. Um, during this calendar year, um, you, you, you've seen a lot of budget cuts. There were a lot of fiscal year 2020 budget cuts and sometimes significant budget cuts because as people on this call know, state and local governments need to balance their budgets, um, sometimes in the billions of dollars. And you know, looping this back to jobs, it's always important to remind ourselves and to communicate to others that state and local budget cuts are often job losses. And this has already happened. The United States has already lost 1.2 million state and local government jobs since January or 6% uh, of all state and local government jobs. Uh, many states are also planning for additional budget cuts in the, in the current fiscal year. Um, this is a little less set in stone because a lot of this will then get worked out during the 2021 legislative sessions. But governors at least discussing cuts of, you know, in the double digits, 10% or more is not unheard of. And it is going to be something that states have to grapple with as they make their budget decisions um, this spring. Another thing to, to note, we know, especially if we want to make any kind of like state to state comparisons is that, you know, savings play a really large role here and savings range a lot from states, but it's not just how much a state has saved. Um, it's how much the state is willing to draw down now versus in the future. Um, some states are drawing down heavily, whereas others are, have kind of concluded this could be a very prolonged downturn, prolonged problem. And so they want to, you know, only, draw down it, you know, so, so much now so they can have more in the future to prevent, you know, even more cuts in the out years. Um, looking at state and local job losses, you know, Kansas uh, has seen 6.7%, has lost 6.7% of its state and local government jobs since the start of the year. Um, again, pretty close to the national average, around 6%. This varies a lot um, where, you know, Missouri, who's had similar revenue changes, has not uh, seen as many state and local government job losses, whereas Colorado has, you know, lost over 9% of its state and local workforce, even though Colorado, uh, its revenues have been roughly flat. Again, this just goes into that there are a lot of factors that are going into this and savings and budget decisions and budget cuts now versus budget cuts in the future. Um, but it's a similar message where across the country, state and local government jobs are being lost. Um, there's just variation because of these other factors. Um, but while we've seen a decent amount of budget cuts in response, we really have not seen many significant tax changes just yet. I think that's mostly just a reflection of this is a quick moving problem. We've had a lot to deal with. It hasn't been you know, much time to sit down and figure out the best way forward on tax increases, but also that tax increases are just really difficult and also not exactly the best thing to do in the middle of a recession. The one major tax increase we've seen is in New Jersey, where they raised uh, income tax rates on higher earners on those on income greater than $1 million. Although it's always important to keep in mind, you know, that states have been talking about things for a long time. And New Jersey has been debating this tax increase for multiple years. So they were primed to make this and might have made it even absent 
of COVID. Um, so it's not surprising they were one of the first to move. Uh, California made changes to its treatment of net operating losses. Uh, without jumping into all the complexity, they basically, you know, changed how they, you know, the, the treatment of the ability for businesses to get support um, and pushed a lot of that into future years. They didn't exactly end this. They just delayed the ability for some of these businesses to claim these um, tax support. You also saw a lot of states decouple from provisions in the CARES Act, which again, most of that had to do with net operating losses because the federal government can deficit finance. They can provide direct support to business through those provisions. Um, a lot of states decouple, but that's a way to prevent revenue losses, not a way to increase revenue. You're now starting to see Colorado, New Mexico, and other states talk a lot about reforming uh, their state income tax expenditures, which is something, you know, if that it's worth the, you have a whole other presentation and something we're happy to talk about because it's really challenging. Um, and I think a lot of people throw around big numbers because states do have big revenue losses from their income tax expenditures, but it's, it's important to understand what the income tax expenditure is and if and how you would want to change it. It's not as simple as a yes or no thing. It takes time and study to understand what you're trying to achieve and if it's the best way of achieving it. But all that said, you know, it's not just tax increases. Um, Nebraska passed a fairly large property tax cut and New Hampshire, now that it has Republican control of the legislature and the governor's mansion is considering business tax cuts. And that's, that's not surprising that, you know, the business tax cuts and tax cuts in the recession is a thing that, you know, a lot of people are going to put forward as solutions. It's just at the state and local level, always important to remember that you have to match the taxes and the spending. And so where are you going to find possibly the, you know, the spending tax, the spending cuts, um, if you are going to think about cutting taxes while revenues are at such a low. Uh, and then finally, just a quick update on what happened this month with the elections. There were a number of state ballot measures uh, in various states. Uh, there's there's always this large desire to, you know, see what the voters, see how voters waited on taxes and, and hope that paints the, the way forward for policymakers. But, you know, there was really a mixed message from voters. Um, for example, Arizona passed a large income tax hike on high earners for education spending. Um, and Arkansas approved uh, a higher sales tax rate for transportation spending. So that's, you know, possibly pro-tax sentiment. Um, however, if you look down further on this list, you'll notice that Illinois rejected a progressive income tax system that would have raised a lot of money. And California rejected a tax increase on commercial property. Um, if you're looking for complication, look to your neighbors in Colorado where they passed an income tax rate cut, anti-tax, and passed a new payroll tax for paid family leave program, pro-tax. Um, my only takeaway is that again, there's all these state you know, state specific factors that have to do with your history, your culture, your politics that go into these votes beyond just what's going on at the moment and the national trends are difficult. Um, but there were some other trends, for example, tobacco tax hikes passed in both Colorado and Oregon. Um, gambling has expanded in several states, including Nebraska. Um, and the big winner was marijuana. Marijuana legalization and taxes were on the ballot in four fairly diverse states, Arizona, Montana, New Jersey, and South Dakota. And it passed overwhelmingly in all of them. And if you think you've already seen uh, after these votes, other states you know, start to move because when people start, you know, whatever a policymaker's views on marijuana are, when people start crossing state lines and sending tax dollars to other states, you know, their ears perk up. And we've already heard news or out of New Mexico, Pennsylvania, New York, Virginia, who also might start, you know, expanding and legalizing and allowing taxable marijuana sales because there's real money to be had here. There's a possibility of tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars based on the experiences that we've seen in states like Colorado and Washington that have had legalized marijuana for a longer period of time. Um, so with that, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have. I've also left contact information for both myself and our colleague, Lucy Daddy, who does a lot of the state tax revenue work. Um, and then one little plug for the final resource uh, at the bottom of that list. We've just published a lot of the data you saw in here comes from these resource, this HTML online resource we created that allows you to quickly select a state and see how the virus is affecting them, how their, you know, their economy is changing and how their budget and, you know, uh, taxes and revenue have been changed uh, since the virus. So thank you very much. Questions for Richard? And just speak up because I can't see if you're raising your hand. Mm 
No questions at all? So, go ahead. Richard, um, I think that, I guess we're really uncertain until we have a new administration and see what's gonna happen. Yes. Um, if you want my honest opinion, I would not be optimistic uh, if there is a Democratic president and a Republican Congress, just because that's based on how those two have interacted in the past. But there is continuing pressure. I mean, we're putting out a blog post saying how important it is that Congress stay focused on the need for federal assistance. I think this is known. Um, so if you if you could be optimistic and that it's clearly on the agenda, and I, I, but it's just, it's a, it's a really challenging politics question in addition to being a policy issue. I don't know if Kim wants to share other thoughts from our national perspective. Um, we've heard some rumblings about whether they're going to try and do something before the new president comes in. I feel like that's unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, because of where the new cases are hitting, I have a little bit more optimism in thinking that maybe they'll try and come to some um, agreement. Again, partly, I, I feel like Joe Biden has much more experience dealing with the Senate. And so hopefully maybe some of those um, relationships might free up some things. And so we're still going to see a lot of this be kind of fraught and who knows, but I feel like having somebody who's more consistent in power um, might at least make there be some I don't know, I've said it every time that I can't believe they haven't passed another stimulus bill. And I feel like there has to be something else going forward, especially what's going on with unemployment and the fact that we're gonna need money um, to roll out whatever vaccines we have. And so I feel like there should be some package coming early in the next presidency, if not before, but I've been wrong before. So I would, I would be cautious. How, I mean, um, how many people are going to lose benefits here? I think yeah. most of the benefits have run out or are very close to running out. I mean, unemployment insurance expansion was the easiest example where that ran out a few weeks ago and there was an attempt to, through a very weird way, keep it going that never really materialized into much. But we've also had the like paycheck protection program, um, you know, that was, that was helpful. But all of those had explicit end dates at the end of the calendar year. So in, and so in January 1, everything is gone. It has either been spent or has run its course. And, and it just feels like expanding some of them. Like given all the attention about debt forgiveness for college loans, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw something where they agreed to keep going with the loan forbearance program, for example. Mm -hmm. so right now, people who owe college uh, student loans don't have to pay it back right now. It's in forbearance. It's not doing anything to their credit. It's earning zero interest. And personally, I think that's a much better response than forgiving that debt. But there are a number of programs like that where I feel like there's a you know end date at the end of the year. I would like to believe that there's gonna be some discussion. Right now, it feels like a lot of the energy in the room is you know, occupied in DC with when somebody is going to acknowledge who the next president is going to be, whether these uh, court cases are going to end. And mm -hmm. so in some ways, figuring out what's going to happen with the transition, but there might be, and there might be some political reason for there to be some sort of new stimulus bill before then, mainly if I feel like Mitch McConnell feels like it would help with the Georgia runoff elections, right? So I think Richard's right. If, if we see stimulus, it's not necessarily gonna be driven by the economic need as much as the political expediency and what people are thinking is gonna mm -hmm. put them in better shape for the next year. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I think if you, if you painted an optimistic picture, it is easier for a Democratic president and a Republican Senate to agree on tax cuts than it is on direct aid. And so, you know, I know this is something tough to translate and, and make into policy at the state and local level, but if the federal government did its job to like kind of put its foot on the pedal, like with a child tax expansion, credit expansion, it might 
lessen the need for Kansas and other states to try and deliver that and be able to maybe just hold the line on their current systems. Um, but I understand that, you know, a federal change is not always a state change. I'm not even talking about tax conformity, but just explaining that and thinking about how you're trying to, you know, generate economic activity. But unfortunately, many times, whether or not tax cuts are passed has nothing really to do with the economy. It has to do with politics. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and everything in DC feels like if you had told me that we wouldn't have a transition team get funded or have access to, you know, what's going on with the public health stuff this far after the election with these results, I would have thought that that was nuts. So I, I feel like the politics are driving a lot of what we're seeing right now. And it's really no different at the state level. Yeah. Politics. Yes. Much of the time determines tax policy as opposed to good economic reasons for that tax policy. Yes. Other yeah. questions or comments? Yeah, Janice, this is John yeah. with Kansas Action for Children. I was just, uh, uh, Richard, I was re uh, reviewing your slides again, and you mentioned some states having decoupling from aspects of the CARES Act, but I know the most kind of recent round of discussions in the uh, Kansas legislature were around decoupling uh, from provisions of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act and that sort of thing. And those to me seem the, like the biggest policy proposals that have the potential to dry up revenue to the state. Mm -hmm. Do you all have thoughts on the, 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 um, the, I don't know whether or not this is a good time for that to be happening, uh, given the volatility of things. It's a great time to look at it um, without going through each one specifically. I wouldn't want to say like an up or down, you know, yes or no to do it. But I think, you know, we've talked to other states about this um, who are going through this. The, the volatility and I think specifically the political uncertainty. Um, the Tax Cut and Jobs Act is set to expire at least the individual provisions in uh, at the end of 2025, which is now not that far away. Um, will that happen? I don't know. Will Congress pass a brand new tax bill? Maybe. But I think we've clearly entered a point where a lot of stuff is going to happen at the federal level. And, you know, from 1986 until 2017, most of these changes were to rates. And so states could kind of just sit by and watch. But the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act made a lot of changes to provisions that filter down and become part of state tax codes. And whether that was good or bad for the state or you like it or not, the problem is it could change. And I think a getting some distance from the federal code, making sure that you're not vulnerable to a sudden change, whether that's a law change or the expiration law is a very good idea. And we're gonna need to see something happen with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, even if we have a divided you know, government, because of those expirations in 2025, it just seems implausible to me that they're just, you know, the Senate is, Republicans are gonna wanna continue the changes that are in there. The Democrats sort of wanna rejigger the whole tax code and maybe introduce something that looks like it's taxing wealth or, you know, things like estates more. It feels like because of that deadline, there's gonna need to be some conversation. It, it's not necessarily gonna be now, but I feel like as we're getting to that 2025 where everything is gonna expire, and I'm hoping it's not gonna be December of 2025, but I cannot guarantee that it's not gonna be as the year is ending that they actually come to some agreement. But I'm guessing they're not gonna want people to see their taxes go up and because many people, even if they got a small tax cut under TCJA, they're going to want to do something to at least figure out what taxes are going to look like. Got it. So when you say um, uh, now is a good time to look at it, do you mean it's a good time to look at it as the state legislature or for, for the federal, for the delegation to look at it? I, I would say the legislature. Okay. I think it's very good to understand how your code is connected to the federal code and the entire, all of it. Um, and what are, would involve big revenue changes, what would involve big taxpayer changes. Because the problem is that, and this is what happened with TCJA, the people in Congress are making changes based on the federal code and the federal code alone. And they often don't think about 
the many ramifications. Um, and I, I'm not even putting that on them. They have enough to do at the federal level. And there are ways in which the federal taxes could go down and state taxes could go up and vice versa. And that's why it's just critical to understand what the connections are and how a federal change in either way could affect the state and the state taxpayers. Right. And like the biggest ones are sort of if that standard deduction goes back to the older level, so it's sort of halved and a personal exemption comes back, what does that look like? Um, I, I don't think we're going to see that. I think practically what we saw in TCJ will be probably going forward in some way. It's just there's going to be a need for negotiation. And the more Kansas understands how federal taxes affect your taxes is going to be important because while I would like to think we're going to see this before Christmas of 2025, I can't guarantee that. Like the number of different versions of the TCJA we looked at between December, between November and December, as they were going through Congress was sort of astounding. And there were things in there that were clearly mistakes that they were just done because it was being written in the middle of the night. And so as basically this is a full employment act for us and it's a full employment act for groups like you who are looking at your tax code. But one of the things to think about is how your income tax relies on or piggybacks off of the federal one. Thanks for that. Any more comments or questions? Richard, uh, this is Mark Burkhardt. Um, have you seen any projections for what holiday sales are expected to be? That's a great question, but I have not. The only thing that, again, I've seen is this the idea that, you know, and I think um, this is touched on, in, you know, well in the presentation about online sales revenue and how more people are shopping online. And that's clearly a thing. Um, but again, it's just understanding that there is a good amount of substitution going on. And that, you know, for example, and then, you know, that has interesting effects on who that benefits and doesn't. And, and there might be, you know, more online purchases because people weren't able to go on their trip or weren't able to go to the theater. But, you know, so that might, it might help the state of Kansas, you know, because more people increase their holiday shopping. But if you look at like, you know, Lawrence and like people can't go to Jayhawk basketball games and people can't go to the restaurants when they go to the basketball games and they can't go out and they can't, you know, do all the economic activity that that typically happens. It's kind of taken from one and put in another. I don't know if Kim, if you've seen anything else. Yeah, no, I just, I, I do think that there's been sort of this expansion, the fact that there's more holiday sales and the online sellers are trying to get people to start their holiday shopping early has been interesting to me. But I think Richard's right that we're going to see this decline in the entertainment part of like holiday activities. And that was something I didn't really have time for, but I do think it, it's we are beginning to explore how this downturn in the fiscal ramifications are affecting states and localities differently. And I think one of our concerns is that it's really harming localities because so many localities, even if you're not like a big destination, like a Miami or a Las Vegas, you still bring in a lot of people to your town. And that's a huge economic driver. And even if the economy stayed flat, you might see this real hard push on cities and their, thus their ability to raise revenue and provide services. And, and that's partly because they have a lot of their revenue coming from things like hotel taxes. Parking taxes. Hotel taxes. And so when you don't have that activity or going out, they're not getting those tax revenues in. Has there been any study, and I assume because it's so few states that still tax their groceries, but has there been any study to see what the shift has been from sales of food in restaurants to sales of food in grocery stores. And I'm thinking of specifically in the beginning of the pandemic when there wasn't enough meat. Right. It was, but one of the things we've seen in Kansas, and I just read an article on it yesterday, was uh, they've set up a connection now, an online connection between local farmers that can take their meat to a locker and the connection between those and individual people who are buying from them, the, from them. Um, 
And I don't know how many of those are actually paying sales tax. And I don't know, one of the things that, you know, one of the things that is a few, is one of the few um, things I'm more optimistic about as we come into more COVID cases. I do think that there are lessons that were learned in the spring that we'll see places take advantage of. So I think, you know, hospitals know more about sort of what seem to be effective services and who should go into the hospital or not and how you treat them. Um, I think we have seen a shift in the supply chains where there were a number of places that had to figure out what does it mean to sort of repackage the kinds of foods that you're selling as you're not selling them to cafeterias or to big places or restaurants. And I feel like some of those shifts and some of those new um, methods of distribution are now in place. So I'm hoping that even if restaurants and bars close again, we'll see there be more access to different kinds of food and activities. But I don't, I don't think anybody's studied per se what it meant for sales tax revenues. Hi, just this morning saw some information from the National Retail Federation who said, and I'm not sure I track all of this, but notwithstanding the pandemic, that holiday sales will be solid. And the survey, the annual survey done by Deloitte um, suggested that there might even be slight growth in holiday sales over 2019. Mm -hmm. And they, and they also said that they would not be surprised if online sales accounted for 70% of all purchases during the holiday season. And, and that sounds about right. Like, I, I think where we're expecting there to be a decline in sales tax revenue are things that are not sort of the physical goods, but some of those other services or things you bought, right? Theater tickets are gonna be down. Ballet, you know, people are not gonna to go to the Nutcracker this season. Did you have a question, Steve? I, I was just gonna say, uh, Secretary Burkhardt, I thought when you were asking about holiday sales, if you were looking for a good deal on an Instapot or a flat screen TV, but you know. <laughs> Other comments or questions? Well, Richard, thank you. And, and Kim, thank you very much. It was a very interesting presentation, interesting and educational presentation. Thank and you. We look forward to continuing to be able to work with you all. We thank you. So, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. We are now scheduled for a 10 minute break. Um, do you all want to take a break? Okay, let's go ahead and do a 10 minute break and we'll plan on coming back at about 2.50. Please don't leave. <laughs> we'll see you at 2.50. Hey, Kim and Richard, thank you.
Okay, we have reached the 250 mark, and so <laughs> we will move on uh, with our agenda. And um, the next presenter is Donna Ginther, Dr. Ginther, and she's going to talk to us on the status of the economic recovery sales and excise tax presentation. Donna, welcome. Uh, thank you, Senator Lee. Um, let me get my slides up and running. Can everybody see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Okay, um, so today I'm gonna to talk a bit about COVID, the Kansas economy, and then dive into our look at sales taxes, business sales taxes and excise taxes. Um, I'm going to live up to my reputation as a dismal economist, starting with the fact that COVID is out of control. Um, in the country, we have exceeded a mil, uh, 11 million cases and 250,000 deaths. Uh, we were talking today earlier in a staff meeting and 290,000 people died in combat in World War II. We are gonna break that record with the COVID crisis. Uh, this map is the percentage change in cases by county. Uh, comparing the first week in November to the second week in November, everywhere that's dark red and you see lots of dark red here in Kansas is a 50% increase in cases. Uh, too much red in the state. Um, these are pictures from uh, today's headlines. Uh, Stormont Vale in uh, Topeka has uh, people have converted uh, rooms into the hallway to fill uh, in order to accommodate patients. Wichita hospitals um, are holding COVID uh, patients in, in the ER because they don't have the beds. And then there's this person in Johnson County who wants to you know, spread the virus, who's actively spreading the virus. Uh, the CDC today came out and said, please don't travel for Thanksgiving. This is uh, terrible what's happening. Uh, if you look at case rates in the state of Kansas, the darker the color, the higher the case rates. Um, in Norton County, where you had that terrible outbreak in a long-term care facility, 185, 186 cases per thousand people. Um, you're even seeing higher cases in the meatpacking counties and even in Northeast Kansas. Um, things are not good. Um, uh, we did a study in October uh, that got uh, media attention about masks in Kansas. Uh, every color that's dark, every county that's dark teal has a mask mandate that they put in place on July 3rd. And counties, of course, could opt out. 
Um, some cities imposed the mandate like uh, Manhattan, but Riley County did not. Um, so this is what it looks like as of this week in terms of uh, as of uh, November 16th, but of course, you know, the governor announced a new mandate effective November 25th. But if you look at cases, uh, and this is through uh, last weekend, um, in counties without a mask mandate, you have uh, over 110 cases per 100,000 per day. And in mask uh, mandate counties, you saw a steep increase starting in the end of October, but there's a huge gap here. So our estimates show that mass counties have uh, about a 60% reduction in cases per day compared to non mass counties. Um, so uh, we find that masks are an important uh, way to spread. Uh, the second thing I wanna talk about is the economic recovery. It's stalled. You know, we had the big downturn in April and May. The red bar is Kansas. The blue bar is uh, the United States. This is year over year employment. Um, so US employment is down 6% compared to a year ago. Kansas employment is down about four and a half percent compared to a year ago as of September. Um, so it, it rebounded in June, July, but it started stalling in August. Initial claims are actually twice as high in Kansas as they are in uh, Missouri. Uh, we've had over 500, close to 600,000 claims uh, on the unemployment system since March. Huge numbers. Uh, and these claims are concentrated in these five industries. Uh, the hardest hit has been manufacturing with over uh, 117,000 claims. And this is sort of a double whammy of Wichita, you know, Sedgwick County being hit the worst, uh, Wichita plus COVID, uh, the Boeing, Boeing 737 MAX plus COVID in Wichita has been really devastating. You have about 56, uh, thousand in retail trade, 70,000 in accommodation and food services, 37,000 in other services, and about 53,000 in healthcare. Uh, our most populous counties, like Cedric County, has an 8.5% unemployment rate. Uh, Johnson is down to about 4.7, Douglas and Shawnee, 5.5%. So the most populous counties have the highest unemployment rates. Western Kansas really is not affected by unemployment. Um, what is really troubling, I hadn't looked at these data for about a month, is that you're seeing a steady decrease in the number of small businesses that are open. Tomorrow, bankruptcy data will come out and we'll, be, we'll begin to see whether or not uh, people and businesses have started to declare bankruptcy. Uh, we're down about 28% in terms of the number of small businesses open since January. The US is down about 24% and we're doing worse than Missouri and Iowa. Uh, the US Census does a weekly survey called the Household Pulse, where they ask questions about lost in, uh, employment income, food insecurity, evictions, not working due to childcare, and uh, difficulty paying for usual household expenses. The red bar is Kansas, the blue bar is the United States. We are doing better, but when you look at the likelihood of evictions in households with children in Kansas, it's higher, it's 50% compared to 44% nationwide. Um, and you have about 12% of households in both US and Kansas who are food insecure. We looked at employment in major cities through September. It's down about four and a half percent across the board. And Manhattan is doing worse uh, for some reason. And Kansas City is doing somewhat better. Now, there's been a question about what type of economic recovery we have. Uh, the Washington Post and the and, and President-elect Biden talked about a K-shaped recovery. That's where the wealthy are, are doing fine, and those in low-income uh, jobs are not doing so well. And trackthecovery.org has been tracking this. And you see there's only been like a, there's been a slight increase in the number of people with high wages in terms of their employment compared to January. If you're a middle wage job earning between 27 to $60,000 a year, your employment's are down to about four and a half percent. And if you're a low wage worker, your employment is down about 21%. And this is the K-shaped recovery. The rich have recovered and the rest have not. 
we can do the same data for Kansas. And you see that actually the high wage is down about 3%, the middle wage is down about 4%, and the lower wage is down about 15%. Uh, so we do see strong evidence of a K-shaped recovery in Kansas as well. Uh, could this K turn into a W? Uh, I feel like uh, a broken record. I've been saying this since July. Uh, the states and the economy, the national economy need fiscal support. Uh, over time, if we do not have additional fiscal support, household insolvencies and business bankruptcies would rise, harming the economy and holding back wage growth. This is uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell. Uh, he's been saying the same thing forever as well. So the recovery, recovery is, has stalled. I don't see with the virus getting worse nationwide. Uh, any hope for a continued recovery. Uh, we have to solve the virus if we're gonna have economic activity and many states are going in the opposite direction. So uh, now I'd like to switch the focus and talk about sales taxes. And uh, my first point is that sales taxes are high in Kansas. Uh, according to the Tax Foundation, the combined uh, sales, state and local sales taxes are the eighth highest in the country about 8.7%. Only Oklahoma has higher sales taxes in our region, which is 8.95. And Nebraska has the lowest at 6.93. Um, so we, for our region, have higher sales taxes when you combine state and local. Nevertheless, sales taxes are the shortest leg on the three-legged stool. So uh, sales, uh, or it's a mid middle leg. Uh, income is 27% as of fiscal year 19. Sales is about 28% and property is about 34%. Um, so sales taxes are still not contributing as much. And if you look at the mix, it was a much lower share in the 90s, about equal in the late 90s. And by 2012, sales taxes were contributing much more than income taxes. So how does uh, Kansas compare to other states in terms of sales tax revenue? Um, you know, Kansas is up here. Uh, the comparison states are Colorado, Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska, Oklahoma. Here's the average rates. Um, our average, our combined rate, again, is the second highest uh, in, the, uh, in the region. And in some cases, we have much higher uh, local rates. Uh, compared to Iowa, for example, and Nebraska. We, uh, at the Kansas Statistical Abstract that we put together, uh, uh, publishes every sales, local sales tax rate. We took the average sales tax rates in the county by averaging all the special tax districts. And you see uh, Johnson County, the average sales tax is 10%. Uh, 9.77 in Wyandotte, 9.7 in Sherman, uh, 9.6 in Seward, and 9.5 in Douglas. So certain counties have uh, almost double digit uh, sales taxes. Other counties are, are close, like Rush County is very close to uh, the sales tax in the state. We did the same thought experiment with the median. You see similar results. The median in Johnson and Wyandotte is over 10% in Gary, Seward, and Shawnee, it's 9.8 to 9.7%. This uh, visualization looks at state sales tax as a share of total state sales tax, uh, total tax revenue, and it's a higher share in Kansas compared to the US and compared to our comparison states. Uh, Missouri and Oklahoma have a low, and Colorado have a low, lower sales tax as a share of total tax revenue. If you look at this over time, you see that we were trending downwards like all of our comparison states and then uh, we had in response to the Great Recession an increase in our sales tax rates, which increased the share of total sales tax revenue compared to the US, which is in blue and comparison state average. Donna, can I ask a question real quick? Of course. 
um, back on that, you said in response to the Great Recession, our sales tax going up, but also we we had income tax changes in Kansas during that time too, where we had to increase sales tax quite a bit to make up for budget shortfalls too, correct? Right, so we went up, we went down, we went back up again, right? In, uh, you know, we went up in tw about 2009, then that sales tax went away, we went down a little bit, and then we ratcheted back up uh, with the brown back tax codes. Okay, thanks. Uh, if we look at per capita state and local sales tax uh, revenue per capita, again, Kansas is the highest in the region. 74% uh, of per capita sales tax revenue goes to the state and 26% goes to the local uh, governments. So we have a huge share here and much higher than the national average. Um, sales taxes as a share of personal income are also the highest in the region. Uh, we take 3.1% of personal income is paid in sales taxes and 2.3% of that is paid to the state. Um, again, this is another look comparing the US and the other states. Uh, when we look at just state level sales, sales taxes, we get, get rid of the local. Kansans are paying a higher share of their personal income in sales taxes, much higher than the United States, much higher than Missouri. Colorado is a special case that we'll dive into a little later. Um, as a share of personal income, it looks the very same as the share of uh, sales of tax revenue. Um, and we started to see a big jump up again in 2011. Um, state sales tax revenue per capita in US compar uh, in comparison states again is higher compared to the US and surrounding states with this big starting around 2009. Uh, now we're gonna shift and look at look look at local sales taxes. Our local sales taxes are somewhat lower than uh, our surrounding states or comparison states, but they're higher than the US. You do the same thing per capita. It's very much the same story, although we appear to be converging to our comparison states once you adjust for population. Uh, this looks at the recent sales tax collections. Uh, the light green is December to March, uh, uh, 2019 to 2020, and this is April to July. And actually sales tax revenues have held up better than in Colorado, Iowa, and Oklahoma. Nebraska, for some reason, went up. It's not clear why. Um, but a lot of this small drop could be explained by grocery sales taxes. Since we tax groceries at the full amount and everybody's going to the grocery store, um, this has prevented us from having a, a larger hit to our sales tax revenue. The issue with sales taxes are that they are regressive. Um, this is from ITEP's analysis in 2018. And it shows that low income households pay a higher share of their income in sales taxes than high income households. Now think about those unemployed workers right now who are you know, scraping by on unemployment benefits. They have to buy groceries. They're paying six and a half percent on the state sales tax of a very you know, paltry income you know, supported by the unemployment insurance uh, system. So they're paying a lot higher than 8% of their total income when they buy groceries, if you account for the grocery price increases. Now this is some analysis where we look at, <laughs> where we look at how low income versus high income households spend in relation to income. And so this is the ratio of people at the third de decile of the income distribution to the ninth decile of the income distribution. And so if uh, the higher the ratio, the more regressive a tax would be on that expenditure. So the most regressive expenditure is rental housing. If we tax rental housing, 
um, then that's going to be very regressive. All spending uh, shows that, you know, the low income households are paying about twice in uh, amount, the amount as uh, high income households. So anything above this average spending uh, is extremely regressive, included groceries, health insurance, telephone, vehicle maintenance, anything below like new cars, vehicle finance charges, rental leases, those disproportionately affect higher income households. And, and so taxes on those types of consumption actually are less uh, regressive. Is that, so, because, is that because high income do more of that? Yes, exactly. Because high income households do all, uh, spend a lot more on food away from home, uh, life insurance, owner occupied housing, et cetera. So because high income households can spend more on that, if you tax those uh, sales, uh, it's less regressive than if you tax groceries, for example. Um, Kansas had, you know, taxes food at the highest rates. Colorado, Iowa, Nebraska do not. Uh, Missouri taxes food at a very low rate and Iowa taxes candy, soda, and juice drinks. Uh, this is from before, this is looking at our hypothetical taxpayer model. Um, if you're married and earn between 125,000, earn 125,000 and you have three children uh, based on your consumption income, if you cut sales, uh, the sales tax on food by one cent, that household will get $61. If you cut it by three cents, that household will get 180. $384. If you look at a single household with no dependents, that household would get $81. So um, the uh, benefits, if you do an across the board sales tax cut on food, would accrue to higher income households. Now, our sales tax base keeps shrinking. Um, services is a share of US expenditures. Between 2000, where they were like uh, just 64%, have increased to almost 69%. So we're spending more on services than we have ever before. And to the extent that services are not taxed, the sales tax base is eroding. So this is the ratio of taxable sales to personal income. And you see over time, you know, starting in 2000, this the slope of this line in Kansas and all competitor states are, are, are going down. And so you see a blip up again from Kansas increasing its sales tax rates, bringing in more revenue. But as over time, as we spend more on services and less on goods, uh, taxable sales uh, as a function of personal income are falling. So taxable sales are, and this is uh, comparing the sales to personal income. Real personal income is increasing. Uh, yellow is Kansas, but the taxable sales revenue is uh, flat, which suggests that the sales tax is really inelastic throughout the region. So uh, Kansas taxes more services, and some of these have uh, our slides are a little dense, so you can you know, dig into them and read them. Um, but I'll just kind of give you the, the big picture. Kansas taxes more services than Colorado, Oklahoma, and Missouri, but far fewer services than Iowa. So Kansas taxes about 74 different services, such as personal services, utilities, agriculture services, and fabrication. However, if you compared us to Washington, Hawaii, New Mexico, and South Dakota, they tw tax twice as the number of services and three times uh, the number of business services as well as professional services. So the fact that we do not tax as many services means that our sales tax base is small. Uh, we do have a sales taxes on specific digital goods, uh, we do uh, tax software, that's all. But we don't uh, tax software as a service or cloud storage or downloaded books or music or videos, any of the things that have gotten us through the COVID uh, recession, all that home entertainment. Uh, 
29 states tax at least two services. Only Oklahoma is the only state in the region that taxes less. You see that Nebraska tax taxes digital services, Iowa taxes digital services, and so does Colorado. So uh, in some ways we are leaving money on the table. Um, so this is a uh, very detailed uh, discussion of taxing digital goods. A fiscal note indicated that it would be between 45 to 50 million annually for the state. Um, some states tax digital goods as an alternative uh, if we tax the physical form. So if you buy a book uh, or you download a book, it should be taxed in Texas. Uh, in May, a proposal in Colorado defined items as taxable regardless of the mode of delivery. Uh, Rhode Island added software and services to its tax base in June. And effective in 2019, Iowa extended sales tax to software and many other digital goods. So states are catching up to this. And then of course, there's the uh, Wayfair decision in Kansas. Uh, we haven't been sued yet for taxing all sales and not having a de minimis pr um, a clause in our uh, taxation of remote sellers. But uh, we are one of only three states um, it's us, Missouri, and Florida that do not collect uh, sales taxes from marketplace facilitators. Um, you know, Oregon, Montana, and Vermont, uh, and Rhode Island don't have personal sales taxes. So um, we're leaving money on the table here. And especially given that so much more of our consumption is shifted online uh, we're robbing the state's coffers. If we think about taxing services, this is difficult. Uh, states have tried to do so, and every time they've tried, it's been kind of uh, hard. Uh, there was tax reform in Utah in 2019. The sales tax base would have expanded, and the measure passed and was rescinded a month later. Maryland uh, tried to pass uh, changes to their sales tax. They did succeed in taxing luxury services uh, such as golf club memberships. At least that passed the house. Um, Nebraska uh, didn't get a proposal to tax all services out of committee. And two states went the opposite direction. Missouri voters in 2016 passed a constitutional amendment to prohibit taxation of additional services and Arizona approved a similar constitutional amendment in 2018. Okay, so in terms of sales taxes, Kansas has relatively high sales taxes uh, compared to uh, surrounding states, and they're regressive. Cutting grocery sales taxes may not solve the problem uh, because more money might accrue to higher income households. Services make up over two thirds of consumption now, and the ratio of taxable sales to personal income has fallen. The sales tax is inelastic. Although Kansas taxes more services than many surrounding states, its sales tax, its service tax base is narrower than states outside of our region. And taxation of digital goods uh, would add more money to the state coffers. Uh, the final topic for today is sales taxes. Oh, there's two more topics. There's the business sales taxes and then excise taxes. Um, Ernst & Young performed a study of business sales taxes. They found what their model finds a really high number of a percent of sales taxes due to business inputs across all states. Kansas is a little low uh, relative to surrounding states. The share of business inputs taxed is in the middle for Kansas as well. Uh, there are several state sales tax ex exemptions for machinery and equipment. Um, all states exempt machinery and equipment from manufacturing. Uh, several states exempted for mining activities. All states exempt agriculture ma uh, machinery and equipment. Uh, there's a lot of exemption of utilities and uh, 
ingredients and components of manufactured products. And you know, there are arguments for and against uh, taxation of business inputs. Uh, so that one argument is that sales taxes should be a tax on final goods. Uh, a counter argument would be that both businesses and households use government so services supported by sales taxes. A second argument is that sales taxes on business inputs result in tax pyramiding. But uh, a counter argument is, is that a substantial portion of inputs are already exempt. Um, another argument is that it's not possible to modernize state sales taxes without exempting business services, but this, as uh, Senator Lee said, this is a political argument. Uh, so services and especially business uh, sales taxes are a difficult uh, thing to change. So finally, I want to talk about excise taxes, uh, known as selective sales. Um, <laughs> Alcohol. These are gas, cigarettes, beer, wine, beer, wine. In the middle of our comparative states in selective sales tax rates, Iowa is an outlier with a $13 a gallon uh, tax on distilled liquor. Um, our cigarettes uh, tax is somewhat low, uh, maybe not, you know, in the middle. And our gas tax is on the lower, you know, in the middle on the lower side as well. So if we look at our per capita Kansas alcohol tax collections and consumption, um, taxes have increased a little bit. Uh, consumption is kind of flat. This suggests that Kansans are now purchasing higher value products with more alcohol. That said, uh, alcohol taxes have increased substantially during COVID. Uh, because uh, you can't really necessarily go to bars. Uh, Kansas liquor taxes have not changed since 1987. And uh, depending on how you buy your alcohol, you pay a different tax. 10% uh, tax if you buy it in a bar. If you go to a grocery store, you pay the state sales tax. And if you buy it at a liquor store, you pay 8% sales tax plus this gallon inch charge. So it's a very complicated and dated approach to taxing alcohol. Um, per capita motor fuels tax uh, uh, collections are falling and this is likely due to more fuel efficient vehicles. Uh, and the gallonage, gallonage tax rate does not incorporate gas price changes. So what about Colorado? Colorado has lower sales taxes because they have higher uh, selective sales taxes on marijuana. Uh, in 2019, they brought in $300 million in terms of marijuana tax increases and the 2020 data are even higher. 10% um, of the retail sales of marijuana taxes are distributed to local governments. And as uh, Richard said, Kansas does not legalize marijuana, although we're only one of three states now that have no form of medical marijuana. Several states are moving towards recreational and uh, seeing this as a way to expand their tax base. Uh, Kansas excise taxes are around a third of the general sales tax revenue. Um, it's similar to the proportion in comparison states, except Iowa, where selective sales taxes are about half. Again, because their tax rates on uh, alcohol and cigarettes are higher. Uh, the vast majority of selective sales tax revenue is collected at the state level, 81% in Kansas and 82% in the entire US. Um, in the U.S., uh, there are other things that account for selective sales taxes, but 25% of these taxes are from motor vehicles, 10% uh, from tobacco. So this includes lodging, which we know have got, have gone down during COVID, marijuana, which we've known have gone up. I don't know what's happened to gambling revenues 
as a result of COVID. Our share looks very similar. Uh, we have higher taxes on alcohol revenues, um, and public utilities and our motor uh, vehicle tax is a bit higher than the US. And in a comparison states, this is excluding Colorado. Uh, looks pretty similar. But then here's Colorado and you can see the 64% of other selective sales tax revenue is coming from that marijuana sales tax. Uh, as a share of total tax revenue, Kansas is one of the lower ones at 9.7%. The US is higher. And Nebraska is the lowest in the region. And as a share of personal income, it's about 1%, which is right in the middle. It's higher than in Colorado, Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma. And per capita, it's about $500 per capita, which again is higher uh, than Missouri, Nebraska, and Oklahoma, but lower than the US as a whole. So what do we conclude? Um, COVID is a problem. Uh, even though we've, you know, we're trying to reinstitute a statewide mask mandate, our analysis shows that it takes about a month for that to take effect. So if people get together for the holidays and there's a lot of research that shows that if you know somebody, you're close to them, you're less likely to wear a mask. So you get together with your family for Thanksgiving. Um, one of them, a person has COVID, the whole family gets COVID. Uh, even with this mask mandate in place, uh, if you eat with your family on Thanksgiving, the chances of spreading COVID go up considerably. In terms of the economic recovery, employment has not fully recovered. Initial claims in the state are increasing. We see more small businesses closing and the economy needs additional support from the federal government. Um, I keep saying that, uh, Urban Institute keeps saying that. And, uh, you know, come January 1, we may see, start to see lines at food banks, uh, more people calling for housing assistance. I was meeting with people in Douglas County earlier this week. Douglas County got $800,000 of rent assistance to help uh, low-income families who couldn't pay rent. That money's all spent. Um, so we may have... Uh, uh, a very bad winter. When we look, turn our attention is taxes, sales taxes are high in Kansas. Local sales taxes push rates up over 10% in some counties. And we're one of only three states that have no marketplace facilitator law and no form of uh, somewhat legalized marijuana. We have many business sales tax exemptions and in terms of excise taxes, Kansas has not changed taxes on alcohol in decades. So that's all I have. I know it's quite a lot. So I would be happy to uh, take people's questions. If I can figure out how to <laughs> stop sharing my screen. There we go. Okay, questions for Donna. Uh, I have one. Okay. Go ahead, John. Great. Uh, Donna, thank you for your presentation. And actually the somber note that you ended on is actually what has been on my mind throughout your presentation and, and really for months now is, so we see uh, uh, while the unemployment rate has gone down since it's high, we still see high unemployment. So people who don't have income but are still purchasing things and paying high sales tax on those things. While we have people who are employed, have the ability to work from home, continue their uh, receiving income and generally have a more favorable tax tre treatment as, as higher income earners. It feels like um, that the, there is, there, there's, a, there's gonna be growing inequity as time goes on unless we make uh, these changes. And I think about some of the people who might be unemployed are also essential workers too, who can't make it work. And, so, I mean, I wonder if you have any thoughts about just that inequity that, that is going to continue to grow if nothing changes. Well, if you, if you look at what has happened to Kansas, the fact that we tax food has really, you know, propped up our budget, right? If you take away, you know, 
people have been going to the grocery store. That hasn't changed. Uh, they've stopped going to restaurants. And so um, that's helped us. But we know that low income households uh, are disproportionately affected by the food sales tax. In fact, uh, I have a graduate student, Keegan O'Connor, who's studying the effect of the food sales tax on food insecurity. And he found that when food sales taxes went up in, Can when sales taxes went up in Kansas uh, during the Great Recession around 2009, we still had our food tax rebate in place and food insecurity didn't change. But when they went up again with the Brownback tax cuts, you saw an increase in food insecurity without the rebate. So the rebate offers us an opportunity to help those low income families while sort of maintaining the budget in a way. It's targeted, you know, we, we've always taxed food. So I don't think we can get away from taxing food unless we really work hard to expand our sales tax base even further. So you're right, John, that, you know, this reliance on the sales tax is going to continue to create inequity in our tax system. So you would need to come up with other forms of revenue if you're going to do something about our sales taxes. Yeah. And, you know, I'm just thinking about the fact that while, while there was pretty significant tax reform that happened in 2017, um, one, uh, one thing that didn't happen was bringing back a fourth income tax bracket that could, I think, um, address uh, revenue uh, so that you could offset it and other offset losses and changes to the sales tax or property taxes. Um, one thing just out of curiosity, you have a slide that kind of lists hypothetical taxpayers. And a thought that went through my mind is somehow if we can map those hypothetical taxpayers to essential worker occupations or experiences to see, are, are we actually finding that essential workers, teachers, service workers, grocery store employees, uh, uh, kind of all up and down the line are actually being disproportionately impacted during this pandemic and uh, need, need, need relief by way of state uh, tax changes. Just something to consider. Um, we can look at how many people have been unemployed and, and who have been, continued to be employed. You know, if I, if I was a data czar of the state, I would be collecting information on what industry people work in who test positive for COVID, what occupation they have for people who test positive for COVID, right? So you could see who's really being infected by the disease. And you think of all those long, people who work in long-term care facilities, right? The, it, we know because of the clusters that it has to be coming in either from the families or from the workers. So you can kind of infer some of those essential workers who are getting sick, but yeah, we we don't we need more information to really sort of address those people who are disproportionately affected by COVID. In this One case. of the things that I have learned in terms of nursing homes, um, I have found that at least in some cases, workers who get COVID are not paid when they're not there working. Right which encourages them to continue working without telling anybody. If, if we wanted to, you know, this is something that Tammy Gurley at the KU Menon Center and I have talked about. One of the ways, one of the things that we could do is in terms of policy is to provide that sick leave to long-term care facilities, make sure that people aren't working in one facility and going to another to work. You know, provide hazard pay or an in increased supplement from the state so that you could, you know, provide the financial resources for those workers to work safely moving forward. That would, pr that would save so many lives in the state of Kansas and across the country if we targeted our resources to supporting those essential workers and making sure that they could stay home when they were sick, that they could get tested regularly to determine whether or not they had the disease and that they got you know, the support they needed to work through the illness if they did get sick, it would save lives. Yes. 
Janice, if I can, I have one more question uh, for Donna. And that is, did, has your research assistant found any kind of connection between if we made the food sales tax uh, credit refundable, if that actually alle uh, alleviates food insecurity? We just saw that when the tax went up and we had the rebate in place, we didn't have an increase in food insecurity. There, there's no way to really see the thought experiment, but I'd love to do it, yeah. but we can't do it with the existing okay. data. All right, thank you. Jana, did you have a question? Um, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Ginther, um, I thought it was interesting in your information on sales tax and states that tax uh, services that Nebraska in our region seems to have the broadest, um, they're, ta they're taxing the most different kinds of services it looked like, or maybe I'm thinking of the, um, the sin taxes and, and the excise taxes. Um, but I was, you know, they, they tended to have lower rates and I'm wondering if, if that is an example of the correlation you've talked about between broadening the base and lowering the rates. That's exactly, um, that's exactly it. And, and has that contributed, you know, and, and in the, um, the Urban Institute's presentation, they also were a state that enacted property tax cuts recently and, uh, you know, is, the re is, is there kind of a connection between their ability to do that, the, the, their broad sales tax base? I suspect their broad sales tax base allows them to keep sales tax rates down. You notice that their sales taxes didn't fall like ours did. Our, ours were flat and other, uh, other states had large drops in their sales tax revenue. Uh, so property tax in Nebraska, at least on farmland is much higher than it is in Kansas. I know that because we owned farmland at the Nebraska line and we had Nebraska farmers that would come down and especially buy pasture land in Kansas because then they would move their livestock to the pastures in Kansas as opposed to having pasture land in Nebraska because of the property tax issue. Now that may not be a, have a large effect, but that is one difference is the property tax in Nebraska on farmland versus Kansas. Thank you. Yeah, actually, I can I can kind of the, the Nebraska property tax cut is I think again a good example of how state specific these things are. Republican officials in Nebraska have wanted to cut property taxes for a very long time, and for a while they kept trying to make a trade where they would raise the sales tax and lower the property tax, and eventually they because of revenue that came in last year had an opportunity to cut it, and they just didn't let COVID or anything stand in the way of that. Um, I don't think it was a response to other taxes performing particularly well. I think it was a was a political decision, something they've been trying to do for a long time. That's helpful context. Thank you. Okay. Other questions for Donna? Uh, we have a question at revenue. Um, Dr. Ginther, have you taken a look at or do you have any information relating to revenue generated among different states as a result of online sports betting? I have no idea about that. Uh, that's a good question. For a long time, we didn't have online sport. We didn't have sports, right? <laughs> uh, uh, Richard, do you keep track of online sports revenue, tax revenue? From all online sports or just sports gambling? Sports gambling. Sports yeah. Yes. Um, we, we keep track of it. It's small. Okay. Um, if uh, the state of Kansas wants to allow sports gambling, um, that's fine. I'll admit that I, I think sports gambling can be kind of fun sometimes. Um, but by the very nature of it, you know, I think what's what, which, what you should know is that numbers get thrown around a lot. And oftentimes people will highlight the amount of money that is wagered. And that's very high. But of course, some bets win and some bets lose. And the money that is taxed is only the money that it's lost. And so cut that and, you know, so it's only a fraction of the amount of money that's wagered end up going to the sports book. And then the tax rate is typically relatively low, 5 10%. And so that's even smaller. And so typically what ends up going to a state is 10, 20, you know, if you're really lucky, 30, 40, 50 million dollars a year. It's not nothing. And especially in times like this, it can all be extremely helpful. But um I think one, the, the numbers get played up a little bit because they're either misunderstood or someone is, is selling the wrong number to the state for what it what can help in the revenue situation. And then the other point I do like to make is that, you know, 
you, the state only makes money if people lose at gambling. So, you know, it, it, it should be noted, there's not free money. It's people are gambling, losing money, and that's how you're getting your revenue. So would you legalize it? I think it's fine to legalize it. I think it's fine to make the money, but I, I get a little nervous when people get too excited about it. Dr. Ginther, this is Sean Toom from the Division of Budget again. I, I write the fiscal notes on those uh, sports betting bills. Um, it really all depends on who's going to be the uh, – if, if the state, if the state lottery runs it, you might get maybe 30, 40, 50 million dollars on a good year. If you allow the, the casinos, the existing casinos to run it, you get significantly less than that, probably more like five or ten million dollars. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions? Donna, I'm, I'm curious about the sales tax. I mean, because we have a sales tax on food, that helped us out during this time. It mm -hmm. seems like, and I don't have any data behind this, and maybe you do, that the prices of food items, the prices of other goods during the, um, the last few months has increased. And I'm wondering what percentage of the, or I'm, I'm wondering what impact that had on the sales tax as well. I mean, it would have increased the sales tax, but as, businesses are lowering their prices back down to what maybe it was before the pandemic. How's that going to impact things? Well, uh, when I go to the grocery store, I'm seeing no evidence of grocery stores lowering food prices. Um, I just see them pretty high. Um, I think that the increase in price means that there's more revenue to tax, right? So uh, I think it's been, you know, it increased tax revenue because prices went up and because everybody was buying groceries, which made prices go up because grocery stores saw an opportunity with inelastic demand to increase prices. So you have, you know, both increased the amount of revenue coming to the state. Uh, food price inflation, I think, is going to be with us until uh, we can safely eat at restaurants again because people are going to be continuing to, you know, buy groceries to a lesser extent take out. Other comments or questions? Well, if not, thank you very much, Dr. Ginther. That was very interesting and very helpful. And we continue to enjoy being able to work with you and your research staff. Um, we can work together longer now. Yes, <laughs> and I look forward to that. Me too. Um, we need to move on now to council discussion. And obviously, uh, in, in my view, uh, the first thing that we need to discuss is uh, what's going to be our 2020 recommendations to the governor. Chris? Janice? Yes. Yeah, I, I've just been sort of sitting here quietly and taking notes of all of today's interesting presentations. Um, one of the thoughts that occurred to me, day, uh, going back to what Larry was telling us this morning, notwithstanding the uh, good news from the consensus revenue estimates, um, my, my impression was there's still sort of red ink on the horizon for fiscal 22 and subsequent years. It, even though the revenues were raised in November, and allotments have been made, there's still a very, very tight budget situation. And I know um, both, both you and your introductory comments and then Secretary Burkhart suggested the importance of maybe uh, having the council sort of underline some of last year's recommendations to see if, if we could try them again as we move forward now with our new charge to continue studying things into the next year. Um, but, but one thing that occurred to me is if we're going to try and do that, I think um, I, I'd like it to be maybe some kind of a revenue neutral type package, okay, that doesn't break the bank that much further. Um, in other words, but what, one piece of good news is two, two of the items on our sort of work list from last year have positive fiscal notes. Those relate to the, the two uh, major items in uh, Secretary Burkhart's presentation to sort of close the loophole on the digital goods taxation 
uh, in, in the name of, of equity, right? The, the book at the bookstore versus a digital book, this kind of thing. And then also, of course, the third party marketplace facilitator, which is just clearly an oversight that was made in years past in our tax code. There's only two other states that aren't, aren't taxing those. And of course, the whole purpose of the use tax in the first place is a, an equity issue for our own state's businesses. Now, if, if my math is right on those, the fiscal note for those two things together, the digital and the marketplace facilitator piece are 76 million, but um, Mark indicated the fiscal note on those may be going up. It looks like that it's possible those are gonna raise more than 76 million, but uh, even so, those together, even as of this moment, appear to me that they would sort of pay for the refundable income tax credit um, notion that was introduced last year where 400,000 families in a more targeted approach would, would do much better under, under that kind of a tax relief measure by restoring the fundability to the food rebate credit. So I, I think there's some ability to uh, sort of have the first two pieces as a pay for um, for the food credit, and then anything else that's left over, perhaps with the um, expanded fiscal note that might be coming for the two positive pieces, could be maybe we could suggest it go into the LABTRF. I know that was a particular priority of Senator Hensley and others last year. And, um, you know, if we're worried about three legs to the stool and the property tax leg is getting big again, that's, that's the method that works to get the money out there to local units. They're statutorily required to reduce their levies when they do get those monies, which they haven't received since 2002. So I, I just think that um, so, some kind of a, a, a package notion might, might work. Um, the only other thought I had, and then I'll, I'll pipe down, is I happened to, when we took our 10 minute break a little while ago, one of the fun things about working at home is you can kind of have your TV on in, in the background. I happened to see Congresswoman Davids on one of the national cable shows, and they were talking to her about the federal legislation that Richard and the Urban Institute folks were, were talking about and um, about the prospects of you know Congress uh, getting off the snide either here um, in, in the near future or on into 21 to pass some version of, of the HEROES Act legislation. And I, I, I think whatever we might think might be available by way of budget solutions or even some form of tax relief is, is going to be able to be that much better if some kind of HEROES Act legislation is enacted, right? There's, there's money in the there isn't just stimulus payments for taxpayers and UI benefits and PPP for businesses and uh, liability protections and other, other things, but there's this sort of fifth prong to the, the HEROES Act package that would include aid for state and local units that can be used to backfill some of our revenue woes. And if we can get that, I think we can, um, we can have more options on the table really for the 2021 legislature. So, so, so maybe there's some thought about sort of memorializing the Kansas congressional delegation to see if, if we can get them to say, hey, keep, keep working. Whoever, whoever the, the players are here, if it's Senator McConnell, if it's the White House, if it's the old administration, the new administration, whoever the players are here, let's stay at the table and see if we can keep, keep doing that. So. Um, anyway, th those are some of my thoughts, just kind of trying to pull together all the different discussions from um, what we've seen here so far today. Thank you, Chris. Other comments? Well, Janice, sure. yes, I, would, I agree with what Chris said. And in general, I think we can make the same recommendations this year as we made last year, because I think they're still uh, should be at the top of our list. I like the idea that Chris mentioned on putting something in writing to ask our congressional delegation to push for a new uh, stimulus package. And as far as a pay for, uh, last year, I remember that we wanted to stay away from language that says pay for. And I don't know what the rationale was for that reluctance last year, whether we wanted to get into actually saying we were going to have a pay for or not. But in general, I think that we can make the recommendations that we made last year 
and going forward uh, on different proposals that we want to to work on, I think once we get into the uh, the 21 session, we'll know more. We'll know what the new administration is going. To, well, we'll have an idea of what the new administration, federal administration, might do, and have more information on our new Heroes Act. So that will give us more to work on when we get into meetings starting next year. Well, it would seem to me that um, we could use some of the recommend, most of the recommendations from last year, but look at the last one, which was cautioned by the governor and the caution given to the governor and legislature and rewrite that. So in fact, it expresses more what Chris has said in terms of um, looking at a payoff or a, you know, keep keeping your revenue neutral or uh, bringing, you know, trying to bring more revenue in with our different uh, recommendations. Other thoughts? Dwayne, do you have any other thoughts? Uh, the direction that uh, the discussion is going seems very good to me. I think uh, basically renewing uh, at least in a general way, the, the recommendations that we had last year seems like a good plan. Other comments? John, did you have something? Yeah, I think the, the, what Chris laid out seems very reasonable and um, is, is on par with, with the way Chris works. So I, I, I appreciate the thoughtfulness of that. I would say that I think I would like to continue. Uh, I don't think this needs to be a recommendation, but I think that the council will continue to explore income taxes and uh, what adjustments might need to be made there for the long haul to, to ensure sustained revenue, um, particularly in these out years that we're concerned about. I would certainly agree, John. Other comments, ideas? Well, then do I hear a motion in terms of uh, agreeing with what Chris had to say using uh, the recommendations from last year with the adjustments um, to the last one, the, co the uh, advice to the governor and the legislature, making some adjustments to that. Janice, since you're presiding and I'm not, I'll go ahead and make that motion. So I would uh, move that just as you stated. I would second it. Thank you, Audrey. Thank you, Steve. Any other comments? Um, I'm, I'm going to ask all in favor, but more importantly, if I think it's more important, if you don't agree, please say so now. Otherwise, we, were we will consider that that's approved. Since I can't see hands for all of you. And since I hear no comments, we will, we will consider that then to be our recommendation for this year. And I will ask uh, Chris uh, to work with the Department of Revenue and uh, restate that final one and perhaps get that, all, that to all of us um, fairly soon. Thank you. Uh, we now go move on to the discussion with the Department of Revenue, Dr. Ginther and the governor's office regarding the scope of future research. Comments? I know that some of us have talked about, and it's been talked about in, in um, our recommendations that we uh, obviously we need to look at income tax. We also need to look at property tax. That's been a big issue in the legislature. In fact, there's been an emphasis on that in the last couple of years. Uh, there's been some which what I would consider, and that's my personal opinion, some rather dangerous and, and not appropriate um, suggestions made. And so I would like that this group has a, a, a um, not a, just a, a working group that will bring back some information to us on property tax. And uh, we'll be naming that group and sending it out to everybody as soon as those decisions are made and as soon as we communicate with the governor to see that, that, uh, that she agrees with that recommendation. Um, other ideas, other things that we need to look at besides that and income tax, as jo John has already mentioned. 
you know, Janice, I was just thinking about uh, this. This feels a little bit like the third rail and reaching for the third rail, but looking at all the sales tax exemptions uh, that exist in statute, I know it's something that lawmakers are reluctant to take up, but I'm just thinking about uh, in this upcoming session with the pandemic still upon us, if there was going to be any discussions about that, uh, ideally, people who are impacted by that, from Girl Scouts all the way to barbers, would want to be able to come in to make their case for why they want a, an exemption to exist. And it seems like this session might be the tough session to allow that to happen and for full transparency and accessibility to the process. But given that our meetings happen remotely uh, and uh, can, can do that more efficiently, I think, than uh, meetings happening in the legislature, can we play a role in somehow fact finding around exemptions? Does that make sense? Yes, other people's thoughts on that? Donna has presented some work to us and, and Donna and the Urban Institute may have more information they'd like to share with us on that issue. Well, depending on what, uh, what happens with the uh, feds, going forward with the new legislature. And if we start having meetings, say at the end of January and having two meetings a month, we can certainly hone in on those those topics along with uh, seeing where we are with, with our other recommendations. Thank you, Steve, that's a good idea. Other suggestions? The one issue I feel like I didn't appropriately cover in terms of our conclusions was the recommendation for the letter to Congress to find a solution uh, for providing more funds to states. Do I have, do I hear any comments on that or shall we just um, turn to Department of Revenue and perhaps Chris to, to write a letter that then can be sent out to us and we can comment on it? Janice, that was in my motion. I understood oh, okay. Chris put that right. in his proposal. All right, thank you, Steve. I didn't understand that. I'm, I'm happy to help draft the letter, but I'd suggest that Larry Campbell should be involved, uh, you know, to help describe the how much that additional aid could help. That sounds great. Larry, are you willing to help? Yes. Thank you very much, Larry. Do we have any other comments or issues that we want to look at? Well, I just want to know if all of our names would be put on that letter to the dele congressional delegation, or who is it coming from? It would certainly come from the tax council. council. We, we could certainly include individual names if people would like that. It's how, what's your feeling about that? Well, to me, it lends more credibility Okay. But others may have a different feeling and not want to have their name on it. I think when you list the uh, tax council and the members of the tax council on the letterhead, that would be the way to go. I would agree with that. Is that okay with everybody? I guess if you specifically don't want your name listed as a member of the council, you would let Corey know, otherwise that will be the way it'll be done. Any other issues that we need to discuss? Janice, this is Shannon. I just have a question um, in regard to that advocacy. Um, are, we, uh, are you anticipating that some of that federal aid um, that we would be asking for would be uh, directed toward public schools? I don't, Dwayne, do you recall last time? I know it was directed towards the state and then the state could do whatever they, what they wanted with, but I don't remember about schools specifically. Dwayne, do you? I do not know. Okay. Larry uh, May. Uh, Some of the discussions I've heard recently by people at the national level have indicated that there is a dramatic need to go, have some of that money go to education. Yeah, this is Kim. I, what we've heard in DC, I think having some of it go specifically to schools and public health for either vaccine distribution or uh, the public health needs are the two areas that we've seen people specifically start talking about. But I don't know if you want to sort of double down on that or you just want to make it general 
talking about what was effective before. There was also, in one of the earlier bills, some of the money was specified for education to help them deal with the COVID um, expenses directly. And that's really what I was thinking of and why I asked the question. Um, those monies have, have been a, a great help, but um, our needs um, in, in, our, in the continuing needs we are going to have, I think are gonna far outstrip the funding that was provided through those earlier aid packages. And so um, I guess I just wanted to offer that if, if we're gonna be specific about listing out any particular areas that we think that funding should go to that um, to consider education as one of those um, potential areas. Thank you. Just out of curiosity, I know that many schools are now providing free lunches and free breakfast to all students. Is that where some of that money has been used? Um, for us, our CARES Act funds have not been used for the school lunch program because the um, federal government extended their um, waiver of, um, they, they have allowed us to provide uh, free meals to students regardless of um, income. Uh, and they've extended that waiver through the rest of the school year. Um, we're holding, I guess we are in my district, I can speak to specifically, we're holding back a, a, a portion of our CARES Act funds um, to potentially cover a shortfall in that program related to, because it's usually a fee-based program, school lunch programs, yes. um, you know, they're, they're, they try to be self-supporting. And so we're not getting any fees. We don't have students paying fees um, for school lunches right now. So, um, but, so that's one area, but I would say there's, uh, uh, you know, uh, PPE um, uh, uh, upgrades to buildings and facilities uh, for ventilation, um, uh, additional uh, staff time for training and re, um, reconfiguring um, instructional processes as a result of having to provide education in different, in different uh, structures and learning modes, um, some support for mental health services um, that our students um, and families have needed. So there's a whole variety of things that those funds have helped support um, to bridge the, the crisis that we've been experiencing um, in, in schools. You know, I'll just, I guess I'll just say that I think that there's gonna be some interesting um, unintended um, outcomes as we enter the legislative session and we, and we start talking about budget and school funding this upcoming year. Um, across the state, we've seen a decline in enrollment in our public schools. Um, and that's, that some of that is due to parents who um, didn't want their kids in, in public school at all during the pandemic. And some who said, if you can't provide five days a week of instruction in person, you know, so there's um, a variety of reasons that that has happened. But one of the unintended consequences of that, I think is gonna be that um, districts are not gonna draw down as much funding for waitings um, this school year. So for example, my district is talking about a pretty substantial mid-year budget cut that we're going to have to make because of drops in enrollment. And um, I'm kind of curious to see how that discussion plays out um, when districts are not um, kind of even getting the funding that was already allocated for this school year. And, and that's going to roll over into the next school year in terms of, um, you know, potential uh, uh, longer term budget cuts and uh, reductions in, sal in staff as a result. So there's a lot of things going on that could be um, really challenging above and beyond all the challenges we already have. Thank uh, you Sen very much. Yes. Senator Lee. Yes. Senator Lee, this is Larry with the budget department. Uh, I, not to uh, diminish what was just said, I, I, here's, here's some numbers for you. Um, the, the first CARES Act, uh, 94 million went straight to the Department of Education, bypassing the state. So on top of the billion 250 that came to the state, 94 million went directly to the schools. In addition to that, of the billion 250, the governor had a 24 million that was designated for schools and was allocated to schools. In addition to that, as the uh, guidance went out to all the counties, which uh, received uh, hundreds of millions of dollars from the CARES Act, they too uh, were told, you know, 
reach out to the schools in your area. And so some money could have come from counties uh, out of that billion too. And then in addition, uh, as was just mentioned by Ms. Kimball, uh, several operational things were changed to where, uh, you know, funding for school uh, for meals, uh, just in the matter of the uh, changing operations. In addition to that, I would just say, um, you know, we're still, and the, and the gov this, uh, Governor Kelly it was uh, the governor who got past the, the education bill to fund per the Supreme Court, you know, uh, ruling. And uh, I do not anticipate backing away from that. And so about a hundred million a year in additional money has been going in. And, sh and I, at this point in time, I do not see that that would be uh, diminished in any way. And then, uh, and then finally, what's going on, which is very complicated, is, um, you know, I, I'm just going to use, uh, I'm, I don't have it in front of me, but uh, per student uh, base is about 4,600. But I believe that online students get 5,400. And so many, uh, it's, it's, it's a little complicated to watch the movement from uh, kids in the school or versus online. So there's a lot of movement here that makes it complex. I do not disagree at all with what uh, Ms. Kimball just said, but a significant amount of money has gone uh, into uh, schools as well as next year should be another increase in the base aid. Thank you, Larry. And please, I'm, I apologize if I came across as, um, I did not mean to give the impression that um, that uh, any of this was due to anything that the governor had, <laughs> had planned or, or and, and obviously we, you know, our, our district and districts across the state have been incredibly grateful for the support of the governor in, in the school finance formula and um, the funding under Gannon, as well as um, we have received a lot of uh, uh, support through the CARES Act funds um, from a variety of, of places. Um, and so that's, uh, I, I did not mean to make that impression at all. It was not what I was intending to apply, to imply. So um, thank you. And, and my response was, I didn't take it that way. I just heard okay. my name mentioned. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to offer some data. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Chris, did you Janet, have a question? Yeah. Yeah, just, just to follow on on some of Larry and Shannon's discussion here, I, I guess, um, it, it'd be my preference that when I sit down with Larry or Department of Revenue and Corey, whoever all's drafting up this letter, we sort of keep it crisp and um, we, we can say things in the letter like, look, uh, if, if you can leave the provision in the bill that was similar to the one that passed the House back in May, um, where there's money coming in to help backfill collapsing state and, and uh, local revenues that isn't necessarily earmarked we can use that money for any number of things, including maintaining uh, our, our K through 12 commitments, uh, preventing cuts to our infrastructure. I'm sure the Secretary of Transportation might, might like something like that. We, we, we can mention some things we might use the money for, but if I understand what's currently been on the table in the talks in DC, it's not specifically earmarked to that level. There is some flexibility for states to do what they want. And so I, I, to me, that means that would flow into the state general fund. And, and frankly, a good bit of the state general fund ends up going to K through 12 anyway. So I, I just think if we keep this simple, it might, it might work best. Thank you, Chris. Any other comments? Oh, other son of a bitch. What? <laughs> I, I guess on top of that, I just encourage, I mean, maybe mentioning something for public health. Yes. Um, I mean, counties have received a lot of CARES Act funding to date, and it's been incredibly helpful, and we're great, gracious that the state has shared that with us to share with our partners. But we also know that it ends on December 30th, but the pandemic's not going to end on December 30th. And as cases are increasing, a lot of counties throughout the state are having to add on additional staff, et cetera to do contact tracing, case investigations, things of that nature. So it might be good to just mention the public health component in that, especially for counties. Thank you, Anthony. Other comments? If not, I think uh, Chris will work on that and with along with Larry and Department of Revenue and um, 
that will be taken care of, sent to the congressional delegation. Um, unless somebody has something else to bring up, um, I, Steve, do you have anything you want to talk about? No, not really. Just uh, to remind people that to anticipate a possible meeting at the end of January, you know, I'm assuming there will be Zoom. Maybe by the time the session's over, the legislative session's over, that we can go back to meeting in person. But at least in the meantime, we will have Zoom meetings. Yes, for the foreseeable future until we feel much more comfortable about the COVID vaccine and how that's going to affect us, we will be doing Zoom. Um, okay. and thank you again, everyone, for taking time to participate today. It's very appreciated. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really do. It really is helpful to have you all present and, and so we can work together. And with that, I believe that we will uh, conclude the meeting. Thank you all. And we'll see you. We'll let you know as soon as we have decided when the next meeting is going to be sometime uh, looking towards the end of January so that you'll be prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.